Okay, um, thank you for coming this evening uh, to our finance subcommittee meeting. Um, there's a lot of people obviously here this evening, so um, in order for everyone to hear what's going on, I just caution you to whisper to each other if you need to speak. Um, we will be, uh, we have an agenda tonight. Uh, the superintendent will uh, go over the items with the help of her team. Uh, Madam Superintendent, would you like to um, open up the agenda with the um, timeline of the budget? Yes. Um, one of the things that I would like to say this evening is um, since meeting uh, and getting the recommended budget from the mayor, we have been busy putting in hour after hour after hour looking at every possible line item in this budget. And that was something at the last school committee meeting on the 20th of May I told you that we would be doing to make recommendations tonight. We are working off an agenda tonight. Uh, I'd like to also, before we leave tonight, come up with very quickly some follow-up dates when we make some decisions uh, on the recommended budget. But before I begin, the one thing that I want to say to the school committee is, originally you were given what is called the superintendent's budget. And it was roughly $173 million. And word had gotten back to me, well, you know, this isn't a reality budget. It really is kind of a wish list. And I want to correct that. When I put forward a budget to you, a superintendent's recommended budget, I am looking at the growth in the district. I'm looking at a number of compliance issues that we had with our bilingual department. Uh, I signed on to a plan to call uh, an AMAO, Annual Measurable Achievement Objectives which allowed us to take a look at some of the split classes we had, providing additional services to our bilingual students, and many of them are required changes. We also took a look at, don't forget, that at the beginning of the month, I was very proud to present to all of you what was called the superintendent's entry plan and strategic plan. And that was after having a district review but done by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed back in November. And if you recall, we talked about some of the challenges our district faces, what are our oppor opportunities, and how do we move the district forward. I was very excited to talk about positions such as a bilingual uh, proficiency and cultural administrator, uh, communications department being built so we can communicate with our parents and our families in ways that we had not done. I talked about a bilingual advocacy center. I talked about a SPED advocacy center. I left that night energized, excited, and felt that we were moving the district forward, and that's what I felt I was hired to do as your superintendent. So I just wanted to set the stage for that was the first recommended budget. Very quickly after that, watching some of the figures coming down from the State House, and some of it was concerning, we put together what was called a level services budget based on roughly $166 million. Now obviously that was a reduction from the superintendent's recommended budget. With that, we talked about some of the loss of race to the top funding, some of the increases that we have incurred, whether it be utilities, step raises, many of the things when you talk about level services, it's how do we run the district as we exist today going into next year. When I received the budget from the mayor, you know that that budget came in at roughly $160 million. That left me with about a, or us, with a $6 million, uh, I will call it, sh shortfall. So that's what we have been busy working at the past couple of weeks. Um, with that being said, one of the first things that we did was we gave out, and it was very uncomfortable, but we were dealing with a date that is contractual with the Brockton Education Association of May 15th. And by May 15th, we were obligated to let our certified staff members know if they would be returning the next year. So we sent out roughly 14% of our certified staff 199 what we call pink slips, reduction in force notices. And what I told the school committee at that time was I did not anticipate losing 199 of our certified staff, but I was mandated to send out those notices, and now the hard work would begin. So, so tonight, I consider this the hard work beginning, sitting with you and going over you know, what we're looking at and in, in how to make up that $6 million shortfall. In the end, what we will have is what's called, obviously, the school committee recommended budget. And that'll be the budget that we go before our city council with uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. Now, before I get into the actual cuts, I want to also talk to you about some of the things that we are looking at to deal with this so-called shortfall. 
One of the things we're talking about and I will present to you this evening is uh, the possibility of what we call early retirement incentives. It is, this is not something unusual. You have dealt with these type of incentives before and this will be not just for our certified staff members but for our non-certified non staff members. It allows us also by having some of these incentives and don't forget when you lay off people and you pay unemployment costs. For every person you lay off, you lay off another two to make up for what we have to pay for unemployment costs. By that same token, as we start to bring people back, for every one we can bring back, we can bring back a couple more. Um, so we are talking about, again, incentives. We'll also be looking at, uh, looking to our staffs for efficiencies. It is amazing, and there'll be a letter going out to all staff members. It is amazing some of the suggestions that have already started to come. Some of them are anonymous. I've received letters in the mail. And these are things that we're taking very seriously. Nothing is small that I can't take a look at an efficiency. And many times the workers that are out there are the very ones that need to make those recommendations. All of those are shared with our Chief Budget Officer, Aldo Petronio, my executive team. And we're taking that seriously. A letter will go out to all staff members reminding them about that. I will also be meeting with all of the unions and talking about ways that we can work together, whether it's suggestions or solutions, to how we deal with this $6 million uh, budget shortfall. So I'm going to uh, talk now about some of the cuts that uh, I am recommending to you. And I want everybody out there, we have a large audience out there this evening, I want you to know, and you've heard me say this a long time, I've been here 37 years. There is not one cut that I'm going to recommend to you tonight that feels good, that moves our district forward, or ones that I would support in having the kind of Brockton public school system that we have certainly come to support and to build and to continue to, to move our district forward. So at the outset, I want to uh, talk about that. So one of the most difficult things we do, and I don't know if we, do we want to put something up here? Do you want me to change places? All right, so let me start with what I'm recommending uh, for staffing cuts. And understand that we already talked about uh, two cuts to the executive team. We talked about five cuts to our BEA administrators. We gave out 199 pink slips to our certified staff. I am recommending to you tonight, across the board in every union, for a 14% reduction in force, and that is for Custodians, which include craftsmen, paraprofessionals, school police, lunch aides, parent liaison, monitor teacher assistants, and a number of our non-union staff members. You will note that under cafe the cafeteria, the cafeteria uh, workers that we have are not supported by Chapter 70 funding. They're supported by money that comes in from Chartwells, and I'm not making any recommendations because I'm not dealing with Chapter 70 with our cafeteria workers uh, and also I'm not making recommendations right now I'm sorry with the school police I have another cut that we'll talk about so in terms of recommendations for staff members it will be 14 percent at this point across the board as we've done with our certified staff members now I've told you before that my priorities are teachers in the classroom but understand that what it makes up in our Brockton Public Schools. We cannot run without an administrative assistant in the offices supporting us in the schools. Those of you out there that are in the schools know what I'm talking about. Paraprofessionals that, su that support our neediest children, that support our teachers, monitor teacher assistants. I could go through every one of our unions and it is important, they're an important part of the Brockton Public Schools and we will do everything to continue to work just like we did with the teachers. So when I say 14%, I don't want people to panic. It's uh, by June 1st, we're getting those notices out. I hope to have them out uh, by this Friday. And again, we will continue to work as we'll do tonight to, to take a look at those numbers in staffing. Um, any questions or? Not yet, Madam Superintendent. Okay, in looking at programmatic cuts, and uh, I've said this to a number of you, we certainly have a large budget book. What I have here is every line item for every expenditure in the Brockton Public Schools. 
We have been over this a number of times. We continue to comb through it. There will be other suggestions that I will make after tonight. You will notice that as far as some of the special education uh, contractual services, I'm working with the director, uh, Laurie Mason, my executive director, Dr. Tarasi, to do a more in-depth look at that to see if we can possibly bring on some of our own positions to alleviate what we actually spend outside of the Brockton Public Schools. You will not see that in the budget cuts this evening, and I hope to have something to you within the next day, you know, commenting on the special education. So one of the first cuts I'm going to talk about, and again, the Huntington School. Back about three or four years ago, you made a commitment to the Huntington School at that time that was very close to being uh, in accountability problems with level four status. You gave uh, out of your chapter 70 and your commitment from the school committee to $300,000. I am recommending at this time that that is a cost that we can no longer afford. Uh, not only was it something I was actually looking at this year because you've heard me talk about the Raymond School, the Iron Own School, the Baker School also having some concerns. And it was money that I had intended to look at to share with uh, some of our other school communities. But that being said, uh, that's not something I can recommend. I'm recommending a full cut in that amount. Um, I will tell you how we're actually picking up some of that cost. I'd like uh, June Sabre to speak to her expanded learning time grant, which is separate from the money you committed for that extra hour in the morning, and she'll talk about you know, how she will uh, support that. So um, for, this is our third year, and we're just about to reapply and resubmit our application for the expanded learning time grant. And that, what that grant does, it, it allows us for $1,300 per student in um, funding. So what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to leverage some of that grant funding to make up for the shortfall that we're losing because we're not getting the 300000 in local funding. But, I mean, that does come with a cost. I have to say that we are absolutely going to have to look at what we're able to offer our students at this time. Um, right now, with that grant, we support an interventionist. We support some of our uh, retired teachers to be able to come in and to support our neediest students. We're also looking at our enrichment. Right now we offer enrichment four days a week. So that's until 355. So we're looking at cutting that down to two days per week. Um, we're also going to have to reduce the amount of our really what we provide in terms of mentorships to our students. We hire both Brockton High School and Bridgewater State University students to come in and work with our students. And so that is something else that we're going to have to um, we're going to have to cut from what we're able to offer our students. And probably one of the most important things that we're we're going to have to reduce is um, the amount of professional development. We're going to have to scale back the amount of professional development that we offer to our faculty um, by about 30 minutes per week. So we're we're really looking at that. And again, that grant is due June 6th. So we're working hard as a faculty to be able to come up with some really creative ways to be able to maintain what we're able to do with the Huntington School. Um, but, and, and we are confident that we're going to be able to go forward and our grant will, application will be accepted, but it is going to impact us in a negative way. <coughs> Any risk of losing you know, matching dollars? It's not, um, they're not matching dollars, and I think the, the Department of Education, luckily we just had a site visit, Am I supposed to be up there? Can you come up to the microphone yeah. when you speak? Am I not loud enough? No. I don't think you picked up. Any of the executive directors, if you wouldn't mind coming up if you're speaking to any of these cuts, please. So, as I was, is this on? So luckily we just had a site visit for the Department of Education. They just spent two days at the Huntington School really looking at um, all aspects of what we're offering our students. And our, our initial find, their initial findings to us were very positive. So we know that they support what we're doing at the school. But none of our 300,000 is like matching against the number. Or anything, right? They're not matching dollars, but when we do submit the grant application, there is a piece in that grant application that talks about how the district is supporting the school. And that's both but it's not financial finan and right, right, and other. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Next cut 
is uh, Edison Academy uh, reconfiguration. Uh, as you know, some of the growth that we certainly have had in the Brockton Public Schools has been our Edison Academy, uh, previously called our Afternoon Academy, our diploma program. We've had a lot of success with re-engaging students, giving them an opportunity uh, for the diploma credential. One of the things I was hoping to do this year was starting to bring on full-time staff members. I'm working very closely with Dr. Cobb. I'm going to be meeting with him this week. And what I'm doing uh, presently is that's a $300,000 cut. I will not be going forward with full-time staff. I'm recommending we stay with the same type of staffing we've had for a number of years, which are our full-time teachers that come in in the evening with a limited number of full-time staff with our principal, Dr. Cobb's administrative assistant, uh, some other some other ideas there. Uh, also, there had been talk of a summer program. The past number of years, we've always had the Edison students that actually go to our summer school, which takes place during the day hours. That is, and they go free of charge, uh, while we have other students that it's a fee-based program. That has worked out for the past couple of years, and that's what I'm recommending for this year. That's a $300,000 cut. Um, with respect to that cut, is that's basically personnel? Yes. So, so is there an overlap between that cut and anything above in the top section? It is not because they did not have uh, full-time staff members to begin with. So, you know, we did not make cuts to, you know, our part-time staff. That was for full-time certified staff. That doesn't mean that some of the certified staff that were given RIF notices might have been your part-time employees. But we'll advertise like we always have done uh, in the fall. We'll advertise, you know, late summer and look for uh, part-time staff, which is how we have staffed it for, you know, the past number of years. You know, it's not ideal. It, it's not what I would like to recommend to you. I wanted to, to move forward with that program, but I think until we have more stable funding or we understand where we're headed with, with the budget in Brockton, and I'm not talking just this year, and we'll talk about that toward the end of the presentation tonight, I'm recommending that we do not hire full-time staff for Edison for this year. Okay. The summer program that our Edison students have traditionally been able to, to participate in for free, um, it's a fee-based program. If those students choose to participate and pay the fees, they'll still be allowed to, or they're just this cut? Will close off the space that they traditionally occupy? No, it does not. So, Mr. Robinson, what you're saying again is the students that have been Edison students have been allowed to come into the summer school day program, and I might have in a class an English class. I might have 10 students that have failed the class at Brockton High, Cardinal Spellman, Southeastern Regional. They come in and they're paying for an opportunity to take that class again. Yeah. While I would have somebody from Edison who could be taking it for the first time, and it's meeting their requirements for taking the course. So they come in free of charge with the 10 that are paying the fee-based, because again, we're getting money from the Edison Academy, so we offset that cost. And we've done that for the past three or four years. Uh, Dr. Cobbs had talked to me about <coughs> doing a, a late afternoon type program for Edison this summer. At this point here, I can't recommend going forward with that, again, under these circumstances. But the students don't lose the opportunity to take the class. They just lose the opportunity to take it for free. W no, would, they be, they, would they be eligible or able to enroll in that class at the, at the fee that the other students pay, the right. ones who? They don't have to pay any fee. They can, if they, I think the most important thing for them is the time factor. A lot okay. of them are working jobs. Okay. So, unfortunately, again, I'm not recommending that we do a totally separate school starting from 2.30 in the summer to, let's say, 7.30, 8.30 at night. Okay. And I think it will be a hardship for some of the students that have jobs and they're working during the day. But it, it's what we've done for the past few summers. Uh, they can certainly come back in the fall and start taking any of the classes that they weren't able to take during the summer. But they never pay a fee from the Edison right now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, under your race to the top possible funding, uh, we have identified, um, again, race to the top has ended, but this is $200, with, excuse me, $200,000 with, with uh, former Deputy Superintendent John Jerome. So this is a savings that we're able to see right now. I know we were just on the phone with him today trying to, to get a handle on what this cost savings would be. Exactly. He said he's going to make some small modifications to what we have. He planned that we were going to end up with maybe about 100000 left over. And with some modifications, we can probably end up with about 200000 that we can carry into next year. So um, he said plan on that amount. The next is the school resource officers. 
And again, when I tell you that the cuts run deep, I think many of you know how important these school resource officers are. They're in our middle schools. Um, I believe we have a 40-60 split. We pay 40%, the city picks up 60%. That's the $125,000. If we're retaining our school police officers, many of them have had training now, I believe, as school resource, or great officers, is it, or school resource officers? Um, and, and again, it's when I told you in the beginning, these were not cuts that I'm comfortable with. I think they have make their great relationships with our kids, with our families. There's a lot of support there, but uh, Deputy Superintendent, do you want to speak to that? Good evening. Uh, the SROs are brought in police officers that, uh, as Superintendent said, are split 60% paid for by the city, 40% by the school department. Uh, by cutting the SROs, instead of cutting our school police force, um, you, do, you will not have to pay any um, unemployment costs because the SROs just go back to the Brockton Police Department to serve in their capacity as patrolmen. So that, that's, that's a straight $125,000 cut. Whereas I think for one cut of a school police officer that's paid 100% by the school department, uh, I think that's a savings of only 30000 per person because of the unemployment costs. And it would be, we, as you know, three of our officers just came out of the academy. Um, so you'd lose the money that we spent on sending them to the, to the full-time academy as well. That's, and after talking to Lieutenant Mills about where he recommended where the cuts would come from in his department, he recommended the SRO cut as well. Because again, that's a straight 100, that's a straight 125,000 with no unemployment costs. Those three officers would just go back to being patrolmen with the Brockton Police Department. Uh, unfortunately, obviously, we lose them working with our middle school students, and those three officers do a great job. They split. Um, I know that Ashfield and East share an officer, the Raymond and North share an officer, and West and, and the Plouffe share the other officer. So they do go between the six uh, middle schools. And, so, and I think they spend some time at the Davis as well. Um, the officer at South also goes to the Davis. So they're, they're an important part of, of the system, and they spend a lot of time in the schools. And obviously, this is not something that you know, is, a, is, is something we recommend as far as school safety goes, but as far as looking at everything, this was the most effective way to make cuts in that department. Would you consider it to be the biggest impact on losing these um, resource officers? I think the time that they spend working with the principals, uh, and Mr. Murray could also speak to this, um, uh, they spend a lot of time on prevention working with kids, preventing things that might happen in the neighborhoods coming, spilling over into schools. Mm -hmm. um, they spend a lot of time talking to kids at lunch. Um, they really build strong, strong relationships with kids because, they, again, they're, they're based in only two schools. So right. they, they really spend a lot of time with those kids building relationships. So, do, yeah. you, do you see that if, the, if there's any way uh, that we can stretch our current officers to have more of a, a, a um, more of a presence in the middle schools to kind of yeah, I'd have to work, work with on those relationships. Exactly, we'd have to work actions. with Lieutenant Mills about yeah. staffing. I know that he's working on doing some different things with shifts. Maybe we have to look yeah. at mm -hmm. you know how many people we have at night to maybe um, put Shift some more the during day. the day yeah. um, okay. to make sure we have that coverage to make up for the loss of the SROs. Because obviously we know the middle schools are it's important to have for those kids that we have a relationship, a positive relationship with the police. Because it does prevent a lot and of these problems. These people will be going back into the police, um, the city police force. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. These all these offices uh, that are SROs, uh, I think, are at least oh, at least ten years, at least ten years experience with the Brockton police. Mm -hmm. So they will be going back to. Um, the only benefit of this is that no one's losing their job. Right. Right. Uh, but again, it is a hit to the school mm -hmm. department because we do have a great relationship with the SROs. Okay, great. Thank you. Do, you uh, do we have that flexibility to move 
people from the night shift to the day shift? Or is that I something that needs to be worked out? No, I think that's, I, I mean, I, we can look at it more, but I think it's in the contract when you have situations like this, it's the needs of the system that kicks in when you have drastic cuts. You can, you can do different things in these, in these situations, yes. Again, it might be a shifting of resources. The you know the buildings, the operation of the schools during the day with our students um, would take priority over guarding the buildings at night. Um, you know, with respect to property damage, um, that would be something that we'd obviously have to shift to the city. Yeah. Um, so okay. Anyone else? Okay. The next. Uh, the next recommended cut is the reconfiguration of Champion and Russell uh, administration. And I bring this up. Many of you know I've uh, taken uh, Cindy Burns down from the high school, the house master, to take a look at Champion to make recommendations to me, you know, from Champion as to how we take a look at our multiple pathways, increase the number of students that are able to take part in the so-called Diploma Plus program. I will tell you Friday. I was one of four superintendents in the state that actually presented at a conference about what an excellent job we have done as a district with our multiple pathways. And many of the other districts attending were complimentary in asking about all of these opportunities when we have a high school as large as 42, 4,300 students, you know, how we keep students engaged. Uh, so one of our thoughts was, again, we would not go forward with a principal uh, for the uh, champion, but what we would do is... Um, take a look at our leadership uh, presently at the uh, B.B. Russell with um, Mark St. Uh, Louis and also with uh, Dr. Cobbs at the Edison leadership, possibly come up with a day and evening type academy where there's shared leadership over those, over those uh, multiple pathways. Uh, if you'd like, I can have Dr. Tarasi answer any questions that you might want to go deeper into those programs. But presently, that was something we had not filled. It was in the previous budget. I consider that a savings we won't move for. I won't recommend that we move forward with that. So that's a straight savings? Correct. Okay. Any questions or comments? Okay. The next one is professional development system-wide. And from the time I interviewed back, back in March, you heard me talk about the need for professional development for our staff. Gains are made by students with the amount of professional development that you give your staff. And you can look at, you can count the number of hours. You, you can see it in all types of data that shows the improvements that students make. One of the things I did do earlier this year, we haven't finished with the supplemental calendar, but we talked about adding additional half days for our staff to have additional professional development. So we are making a recommendation, and again, this is one that, that hurts but I'm making a recommendation that our line item for professional development uh, is decreased by $100,000. And again, we'll support some of that professional development with the additional half days that we're recommending for this coming year. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Liz Barry, do you want to speak to that? Superintendent Smith indicated um, we really are trying to um, save some funds by picking up three additional in-service dates for the elementary level, which will require less of a need for substitutes, which is how we do our professional development. Um, that being said, three additional days, um, the $100,000, will, will, um, we will still feel the impact. I mean, we're going to be starting the school year having to make tough decisions about who is going to receive what professional development opportunities because we do not have enough funding to really prioritize for everyone. Um, and that's a difficult place to be in at the beginning of the year. But if we're talking about um, putting teaching positions um, as our number one priority, it, it, is, it is a decision that we unfortunately are um, required to make. Um, any impact on the compliance issues in this regard? I know some of our professional development recently has been in regard to, like, you know, the evolution of PARC and mm -hmm. some of the pieces that come with that, our, our teacher um, evaluation systems. Right. 
Um, one of the things that we've been able to do in Brockton is we've been able to maintain compliance with the professional development opportunities that we have to offer, um, access testing, um, things related to park administration, um, and there, there's a whole host of others, uh, issues related to educator evaluation. We've been able to do those things and then some and really focus on instructional practices that we think will be worthwhile for our students and for our teachers. Um, uh, but to answer your question, I, I'm afraid that we'll, we will be required, we will not be able to do as much of those choice options that, we, that we've done over the years. And the substitute savings you talked about, that's in addition to the substitute teacher's line item that's also going to be talked about, I assume, in a few minutes? That's in addition to that. Okay, so so there, it's not like a double bill, right? And like I said, I mean, a hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money. We do feel a little better because we are starting the year with a structure that allows for more professional development opportunities in the school day. But that's just at the elementary level. So this impact is primary at the elementary level because it's a district-wide impact. But um, we do use more professional development funds at the elementary level um, because we do not have that time during the day. Due to the, the lack of, <laughs> of the time in the schedule right. for professional development that middle, our middle schools and our high school has. Right. It's that, right. and it's also the volume of teachers for which yeah, a professional development opportunity is apl applies. Okay. Thank you. Recommended budget. There was an increase for professional development of a little over sixty-three thousand. So this hundred thousand um, dollar cut represents sixty-three thousand of that is the increase, and then another forty odd thousand into what we're currently budgeting. Um, I have a question on the sixty-three. Can you tell me what that was earmarked for? That increase that we're no, no longer going to be able to offer. That was in the ordinary maintenance portion, so that would be materials and supplies. Okay. Because we have it in both sections. We have it in the top section as uh, covering, you know, costs. For personnel. For that, personnel. that was, and that there was no increase. Correct. That covers for that portion, but for the 63000 was for materials? Yes. Okay. Any, can you give me any idea as to what specific professional development opportunities are not going to be able to be realized from that $63,000 cut? Um, just, that I we, mean, off we're, the we're obviously expanding. Right. So what are we not expanding any longer because of no longer having these additional funds? Mm -hmm. There's one professional development opportunity that um, is probably more costly than others, and that's our citywide professional development trainings where we're taking all teachers from one grade level and they're spending a full day together. Um, that ends up to be quite a bit of money because we're talking about subs in each one of those classrooms. Yeah, but this is ordinary maintenance. This is materials. Okay, maybe you can find out. Okay, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Um, I just want to know what we're not going to be able to offer next year because obviously this, there's a rationale behind that 63000 Okay, and then in addition, the forty thousand that represents the rest of the hundred. I'd like to know what we're not going to be able to offer that we're currently offering with that cut. So, what we can't offer it in additional funds that are earmarked, mm -hmm. and then also what we can't offer that we're currently offering with the forty k okay. that we're not going to have any longer. Especially with the hundred, we'll give you a breakdown okay. of exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. The next one, any, I'm sorry, any other questions on that? The next one is we went through the budget. Uh, some of them were repeats in the budget. This one was extended IRC day at Brockton High School, and I do want to let you know that we will continue to offer uh, Principal Wolder is here, and I believe it is each day one of the IRCs is open so students can do research. So I want you to know that is protected. This was in addition to the one day a week that is open in the, the red, the azure, the yellow, the green that will continue to remain open. But this was uh, one that we identified with uh, an ability to cut it. The next one is the middle school science fair. Uh, those of you that attended the science fair this past year at the George School, you see the wonderful things that are created by our students, the groups of students. Many go on to regionals, to state competitions. What this does, and I feel very strongly about the haves and the have-nots, 
this has always provided extra support. Some students go home and their families run out and buy materials, supplies, you know, support their students as they prepare these projects. Other families aren't able to do that, and this provides teachers to work with the students during getting ready for middle school science fairs. Some of it is for the materials. So again, that is something that we're, and we try to stay as far away from, as you see us go through this, the academics as possible. But this was one of those uh, cuts that I am recommending at this time that we make. Uh, Dr. Murray is here and can certainly answer any questions that you might have about it. So this would eliminate that additional help with respect to um, materials as well as, um, let's call it tutoring or support. instructional mm -hmm. support? Okay. Um, <coughs> Well, as we go through things, we sort of asterisk items, <laughs> so that's something that I would definitely want to further look at later on. Mm -hmm. um, um, just because things are recommended to be eliminated doesn't necessarily they, mean they are, or that is a small item in light of uh, the total deficit. Um, I, I just think that it means a lot to those students who seek that assistance and um, definitely benefits them um, in ways that uh, is just um, invaluable in some instances. Um, Andy? How do, how do students currently access those resources? The teachers are available at the school and it's, um, they're all welcome. There's no limitations. So, um, so it's basically like a teacher in a room, and if students want to come. Right, and because of the nature of the science fair itself, it's usually something where they'll develop some ideas, and then as uh, time goes on, the teacher will work with that student uh, on the scientific method, actually creating and then perhaps maybe performing the, uh, the activity, and okay. then putting together the paper and the presentation of the science fair. So we just kind of have a pot of paper and poster boards and whatever the kids need, and, and then like a teacher that is accessible at every school, at every middle right, school? every building. For like an hour after school for? Actually, it's, I think they're paid for an hour, but typically they're there longer, as most of the stuff doesn't lend itself to being completed. How long does that extend out leading up to the middle school science fair? Uh, honestly, I don't have an exact time frame for you on that, but I, I would venture to say anywhere from six to eight weeks. OK. And something like that? Um, I wouldn't put that beyond the reach of a conversation with our middle school PACs. I think that if you presented that to every middle school PAC um, that is active, that they would see something like this worthwhile as a donation to an account like this. Um, so let's, like I said, let's asterisk that. and see about what options are available. You know, and th this goes back, uh, you know, as I said, I've, I've been in this business a long time, and back when we had a lot of grant money coming in, and we had after-school programs, one of the things we had was homework cabaret. And it was, you know, there was a difference between kids that went home and had support and those that needed the support, many of the English language learners. So I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, this was to, to equalize the playing field for all of our students. With that in mind, are there transportation costs associated with that? If a kid chooses to stay a couple hours after they find their own way home. Yes, there's no transportation. Okay. Just one quick question on that. Um, do you know on average how many kids are serviced by this every year? I can only speak to my building, uh -huh. but uh, it typically would be maybe a dozen, 10 to 12 students. Really, that yeah. many, huh? And okay. They may not all be there every session, but there is uh -huh. a component. For instance, they have to do a research paper. Yeah. They may need help with that. So we've actually split it up so that we'll have maybe a couple of English teachers near the end of the project mm -hmm. to help them with the research paper. And in, in the beginning, we may have a science teacher too. So sure. it kind of you know, varies on need. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Thank you. The next one uh, is what's called Family Connections. And again, this was a program that we were very proud of. We were beginning to grow. And I'll remind you that the first year, we actually had it at the Huntington School when you committed the 300000 we had a morning session and we had an evening session where parents could come in. They would take English classes. Uh, there were a beginner level, intermediate, more advanced level. Those parents actually came and spoke to you as a school committee 
at the end of the year telling you how important this was as far as supporting their students, acclimating in the community. Um, we had talked about growing this when I talked about the entry plan and presently with uh, the situation the way it is, I'm recommending that you cut that program and that's $25,000. We had expanded it uh, to, it was for east and north parents mm -hmm. when we had split the uh, population between east and north. We housed it at east, um, and I believe it had been picked up by a grant. Okay. Um, going forward, we, had, we even had a grant from the bilingual department. I'm not sure if Jose is here, but we had a grant that picked up um, at the Raymond School a year ago. So we continue to look for those pots of money, mm -hmm. but this was money through your Chapter yeah. 70 money that we had committed to the Huntington and had talked about in the entry plan growing this. The next one, I, I'm sure you all know how I feel about this and again you go back to 2001. One of the things that you made a commitment as a school committee to do that as we had grant funding such as 21st century, what we had in the city were those schools that qualified to be 21st century schools and those were your after school programs. You provided uh, academic support for some of your neediest students you also provided some of the arts, some of the enrichment activities. And your $350,000 from local money were for those schools that were not designated as 21st century. So again, there would be equity in the district for students receiving academic support. That is a total budget cut for community schools. We did leave in um, a match for the 21st century grant. It's probably about $240,000. That, because I don't want to lose the 21st century grant funding, at the expense of cutting all of the money. But this is a $350,000 uh, cut in your after school programs. You would virtually have some schools that do not have after school programs. Now people sent me notes when you talk about efficiencies for have you thought about you know, having fee programs? And you know, that's something that we can consider once we get through budget cuts. Um, I have concern about that, but I am recommending that you cut $350,000 in after school programs in community schools. Can you give us a breakdown of um, what schools will be impacted and what programs within those schools will be impacted? I can, Laurie. I mean, you I don't have to give it to us right now, but if you could get it to us, that'd be great. Yeah, I met with Maxine today, and um, you know, there's a number of grants that support a lot of the programs. Right now, our 21st century sites are Southwest, our known Georgia North. Correct. So it would be. Uh, you know, many of your other sites that are servicing uh, after school programs. But we can get you details on that. Okay. Um, the next cut was again a homework helper. Um, we were, again, not something that we're recommending that we continue forward with. That's $12,000. It was, again, something that we were using at the middle school. It was after school help for homework, probably similar to the homework cabaret that I described. And again, it would be support for, for students in after school programs. The next cut is uh, $250,000 to substitute teachers. We struggled with this because all of the money that we had budgeted for substitute teachers up to this point has been used and many times we go over our budget in substitute teachers. We've had a lengthy discussion about looking at the different levels, about are there ways that we can possibly support the high school by bringing in permanent subs, by bringing classes together if we have opportunities where we need substitutes at the high school. I think you full well know that at an elementary school we need elementary school students to have a substitute teacher in front of them. So we were rec recommending something very different for each of the levels. Out of over a million dollars, uh, we're recommending at this time, we're working with Dr. Moran to put safeguards in place as far as how we hire substitutes. We'll have to watch that line item very, very carefully. So conservatively, I'm asking for $250,000 cut in uh, substitute teachers. see the impact in terms of, you know, uh, how operations would take place during the year without that money? Meaning the impact on... To the schools and the classroom? I, I think we'll, it will impact it greatly. So, I mean, uh, a, a classroom is going to be um, 
I mean, they're not going to be unsupervised, but how would the supervision take place? I mean, Never unsupervised. I think there are ways where if people have a prep period, they're able to come in and support a class. We would bring a number of classes together. We're looking at a cost savings of bringing into buildings permanent substitute teachers, and they would, you know, certainly go throughout, let's say, Brockton High School or the middle schools. Those are our options we're looking at at the middle school and high school level. At the elementary school level, I would have to have a substitute in, in every class. How feasible do you find that solution? I, I, as I said, we, we already are at May 27th today, and we have used up our budget for substitute teachers, and that's over a million dollars. So I'm, I'm recommending to you, I'm trying to be conservative in saying that that's an item that we will follow, we will watch, we will take a look at our sub finder and block out substitutes being able to, you know, cover classes, let's say at a high school level, and we'll have to come up with other solutions for um, making sure that there's supervision in those classes. It'll be bringing classes together. It'll be certainly a loss in instructional time. How, how do you see handling situations, say, at the high school where you're sending kids to the cafeteria and having a substitute cover it and they're, you know, say three of their teachers are out in the same day or they're out for a long period of time because then kids are losing a yeah. long period of time in the classroom? We're not, we're not talking about long-term subs. I'm not talking about a, a maternity leave. I'm not talking about those are obviously, you know, teachers that would be covered. So they would be, I'm talking about the day-to-day -day loss of a teacher being out for illness, personal day, uh, you know, more, more sporadic than uh, as opposed to long-term. Okay. So you would think the greatest impact should be the high school level probably? I don't want to impact the high school level. I'm hoping that we can find other solutions for those students that are going from class to class to <clears throat> class. That if we have four permanent subs at the high school, that's four people that I have there all the time. We also would use the assistance of MTAs, of teachers covering for different periods. I don't know, Sharon, if you want to talk about, you probably do some of that now at the high school to cover uh, classes. It depends on how many people are out. There are days where there would be a significant number of students that somebody's duty would be to be in the cafeteria and monitoring the students versus having them in a classroom with a substitute. So there will be an impact at the high school level for that. Uh, for long term, as uh, Superintendent Smith said, we have to get somebody in there to cover those classes uh, when somebody's out for a significant amount of time. And we do have teachers who we pay them extra to give up their prep time to cover those classes. So that we would need to be able to continue for long-term absences. <coughs> but with a school that size, you get a significant number of people out and they're throughout the building and then we just have to make sure that they're properly supervised. Ms. Clark? Would we develop cutoff periods of time, say, you know, during flu season, teachers are out, you know, you could be out for a week with the flu or a serious illness, so are we gonna develop some sort of time period that prevents kids from being out of the classroom for a long period of time in situations like that? I know, I've seen the sub list at the high school, I know it can be quite lengthy sometimes during the winter months, so. I think what we, what we need to do, again, is, you know, we sat, you know, today certainly going back and forth on this because educationally, this is not something we want to support, but we're taking a look at a large line item in the budget and we were, you bring up a good point. I mean, we were talking sporadic absences, but you could have somebody out for the flu for a week, and that's a loss of, of certainly teaching time. Uh, so I think we'd have to come back with you for some strategies. Uh, as I said, we were hoping to put some safeguards in place at different levels to carefully watch. Um, maybe that's, again, some money we have to put aside, but you know, try to, to keep a handle on our substitute expenditures for next year. I could report back to you at different <coughs> intervals and we can see where we are this year as compared next year as compared to where we were this year and see if we're finding those cost savings so if they're in the if they're in the cafeteria because there's there's no teacher available so you have a whole bunch of kids in the cafeteria they're not really getting any instructional they're just basically getting a monitor to make sure that correct so they really do lose a, a real day of instructional time. You know, many times, to be perfectly honest, it's a struggle to get sub. Actually, this year I was going to come to you to talk about raising the
the amount of money that we actually pay substitutes. So we could compete with some of the neighboring towns to make sure that we're able to staff those classes. I think it's that important. But, you know, as I said, nothing about this feels good educationally. These are not my recommendations other than I am looking. If I have a choice between cutting some of these different expenditures and having a full-time teacher in a class, that's what I'm looking to do right now. That is the priority. But I actually wanted to come to you and talk about raising what you were paying substitutes so we could be competitive in the process and make sure that we were getting substitutes that are out there, especially quality substitutes. Although when we exceed this line item, I mean, I know sometimes more or less, uh, how do we backfill those dollars? Well, many of the personal services line items um, are factored by a percent increase each year. Okay. So there's always a little bit of cushion, and I count on that to balance off whether we have a lot of substitutes one year, whether we have a lot of uh, workers' comp cases, you know, costs that come up, okay. whether my unemployment costs go up. They kind of um, offset one another. So as we tighten up on these line items, I also get nervous that my um, ability to move monies around becomes tight also. Yeah. Now, oftentimes when we shift dollars off of something, we can do it with, like, grant dollars, right? So, so if we can pay for one teacher position with grant dollars, we can shift their salary to another place. Exactly. Because it's our dollars. Does that happen in regards to the substitute, or is it mostly you're using this cushion of a pot of money that's used for a bunch of different things similar to that? Mostly that. At the end of the year, I go and look for those grant dollars that are available, and I'll try and get them back. Um, in the, is the substitute teaching line item the only line item in that kind of cushion or that the percentage pot that's being impacted? Or are, are you looking at cuts to like that workman's comp? Right, no, I'm not so looking to cut to workman's comp. Um, th that line, line item is um, pretty much funded the same amount every year, and we've been pretty consistent in what comes out of there, um, workers' comp and unemployment. So unemployment line item has been pretty steadily under control the past few years because we haven't had any layoffs. We, we don't, um, people leave on their own accord, they don't leave because we're laying them off. So, um, but as we make these cuts, my unemployment line item is going to increase. That's part of the offset. Yeah, so, so do we foresee, because the, the potential for unemployment costs increasing if we're not able to call back teachers before the end of the year also increases. How does that impact this kind of? As, when you look at the positions and the reductions, the, the budgetary savings are just the actual savings. Okay, so they've, that, that budgetary savings already factors in unemployment it, for it, all of those folks. Correct. Okay. Unemployment and also um, some health insurance. I put okay. a, a factor in there for health insurance. So okay. um, that's why the superintendent said as we have funds to call people back, we can actually call, we can more call back, back a little we're more back. Exactly. That unemployment cost. All right. Thank you. The next three items together are uh, 1,800, 9,500, 2,500 is a program that you had previously called Freshman Academy. Uh, this year you've got the Rising Ninth program at Champion, Edison. Your multiple pathways are available through the Pathway Center. We eliminated uh, this program this year, so it's really the first opportunity I have to cut it from the budget. So this is a recommended cut. I can have Dr. Tarasi talk to you about where we're headed. Uh, but it's, it was money that was in the budget that is not necessary at this point because of our other additional pathways. You're telling us that's an easy cut. We feel that's an easy cut. We're able to make it up with, you know, as I said, the Rising Ninth program. We have the Pathways Center. Uh, okay. I mean, I'd rather not, you know, since you feel confident that those resources can be made up in the different program, why, you know, why um, continue talking about, you know. Um, okay, Plato Credit Recovery? Well, Plato Credit Recovery, uh, again, I had uh, Sharon Wolder in this past week to go over some of the, and I want you to know that when we made these cuts, we took great efforts to bring in the principal at the high school, the special ed director, um, coaches, athletic directors, uh, department heads. So people were brought in to make a statement about their level of operation. Under Plato Credit Recovery, it is a program that is used by a number of teachers at the high school, but you, all, you already have also Odyssey Wear, 
and that's a program that we use for credit recovery uh, in many different areas in our school system. So I am recommending that right now that's a luxury that we can't have. Although there are teachers that use it, it's a $50,000 savings. I would rather continue to use Odysseyware, which provides a very similar service. So we can shift kids at no extra cost to the Odyssey off of Plato. We have enough licenses, I believe, that we'll be able to use Odysseyware in place of Plato. Okay. So no decrease in ability to serve. Well, I talked to, again, Sharon Wold, who was in on Friday, and said that there are teachers up at the high school that use Play-Doh with our students. Um, very few teachers actually use Play-Doh. The English department uh, has some ninth grade teachers who use it, uh, but obviously where it's compatible to what Play-Doh provides, and so it would be a shift in that. Uh, the math department moved away from it <coughs> years ago, and they have not used it. So uh, for us, the, the licenses for Play-Doh it's pretty much you're doing the same thing with Odyssey Wear. So they prefer the Odyssey Wear, so we make that shift. Minimal impact. Yes. Um, the uh, this athletic equipment is again. It's af it's actually the intramurals. Uh, no. I'm no, this one it. isn't. This is the one I put in. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, where did that? In come the budget from? earlier this <laughs> year, I put in an extra fifty thousand in athletic equipment because they have a revolving account that all the receipts from the football games go into. I wanted to try and restrict that revolving account to maintain the turf at the Marciano Stadium. So I was hoping to put the money in their budget and restrict that other account. And at this point, it looks like we can't. We can't afford to do it. So it's really not a. Exactly. It's just something that you were looking to create a budget, another budgetary item for maintenance, future maintenance of the exactly. field. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's exactly what I was looking okay. at. Okay. Anyone? This is Joyce. On the um, recommended budget, there was an increase under ordinary maintenance for um, the athletic program of 141000 Yes. So. That's, that's because we pre-bought all their equipment last year. Okay. So that's, you saw a zero for the first year on that um, page there. That's right. That's because yeah. we pre-bought it all. So we weren't able to pre-buy it this year. So mm -hmm. that's for the full budget to go back in. You'll see that in a few spots. Anything, some of the cleaning chemicals and supplies, right. you'll see a zero because we, if we pre-bought them, we took them out of last year's budget. Okay. We zeroed it out, so that's why. So we have no choice. We have to. Yes. We've already purchased the equipment. Well, we, no. Well, we, we pre-bought it. We pre-bought it the year before. The year before. So for okay. next year, yeah. we don't have the money to pre-buy. So we're just putting the money back in the budget. Okay, and that includes that that live football and the, the insurance for the football and the liability, because that mm -hmm. has a zero and then it's got five thousand dollars. Yes, for this that's year. correct. Okay. So the cut that you're recommending has to do with the revolving account, then. Yes. Okay. So there is no impact on our existing programs. Correct. There's no impact. Okay. They will fund what they need from their revolving account. Okay. The next item is $80,000, and that's Afternoon Academy. And that is money that you committed back a number of years ago. It really was kind of the startup money for what is now your Edison Academy. Because you are seeing Chapter 70 money come in, because we're able to count them in the October 1st report, you know, that is money that we no longer will use at the Edison Academy. So that's a straight cut. And, no and that did fund salaries, that funded um, personnel lines. for Edison Academy. Is that having an impact with respect to the um, Edison Academy reconfiguration? Or? It's an additional cost. Uh, help. The next one is again a library clerical help. That's a thousand dollars we cut. <coughs> and what exactly is that? I believe it's uh, looking at inventory. There's any number of things that they're able to do in the IRC. And again, we just felt some things are going to have to get done uh, during the regular, the regular hours. So that's not cutting down on access in terms of time for service for students 
not no. not in the summer. That's more like inventory type. I of think stuff. this was putting the, the numbers on the books. books. Okay. Um, anyone? Okay. Extracurricular. Under extracurricular activities uh, in the middle schools, uh, we're recommending uh, cutting. Uh, you see, uh, forty-three thousand dollars. It includes cheerleaders, newspaper, stockroom help, workshop band, yearbook, uh, a number of again activities that you know benefit our children. But when I keep going back to the priority being the teacher in the classroom, you know this is something that uh, could be a cost savings for us to the tune of forty-three thousand dollars. Um, those are examples of programs, or are those the programs that will be impacted by those this cut? Those are the programs. Okay. And why these programs over any others? Because of participation levels? Participation or? is a big factor. Um, and then again, we're trying to minimize the impact in terms of numbers of students involved. So, so these are programs that happen at every school or only some of our middle schools? Not every program occurs in every building, but for the most part, the ones that you see on this list occur in all of them. So this, these For programs instance, are cross-building, uh, <laughs> but presumably low, lower attendance than some of our other middle school activities that we also, also fund. And, and once again, I'm going to remind you that when I started tonight, one of the things we talked about was to have our kids in after-school programs is a plus for Brockton, to have kids involved in any number of activities that we're going to talk about. So when we say we're recommending this, we're recommending this, you know. Would it be possible to see this breakdown? It, it, like uh, in terms of? Well, for example, uh, all of the schools are going to have somebody that does the stock. That yeah. is actually not something that really is a student-related activity yep. in the sense that that's an adult in the building. That we provide an opportunity for students to do it. As everybody has it. Uh, the workshop band is something that is unique to two buildings. Um, so I, I can Two give buildings. you a breakdown as far as the eight middle schools, which programs exist. What exactly is the workshop thing? To be honest with you, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would like to see a breakdown of how this $43,310 is split between those programs. If you look at page 12, if you have this packet. I, I do. Page 12 has a breakdown at the top of the programs you're looking at. A variety of programs? Yes. And you can see that like, the workshop band is only at North Junior, uh, North Middle School. It's not at any of the other schools. Okay. Um, if we have the cost breakdowns, then I'd just be interested in which buildings have these programs. And they're, they're listed. If you look at the top, each middle school is listed. Oh, okay. Cool. So when we went through this, we, ought, you know, we said band is something that we know there's large participation. We left choral. We left drama. We left the student council. We just see participation levels then? I mean, so we can, if, if we're going to say pull out one of these programs to save it, we may pull out, you know, the whatever, $8,000, $9,000 of that, you know, 43000 to save the cheerleaders if that's the highest. You know what I'm, like Tom said, there's an asterisk next to that for me, and I'd like to be maybe a little bit more scalpel ready if, if necessary. I'd appreciate it. The next one again was we uh, brought Sharon in and we looked at every club at Brockton High School. We're recommending a 20% cut across the board. I'd like to see uh, Sharon again work with uh, the teachers at the high school to determine which of those clubs are active clubs and you know, within uh, an amount of money to make sure that they're meeting on a regular basis. Most of them, these are stipend positions. So it gives us an opportunity and the principal to take a look at, as you said, Mr. Robinson, what is the participation, uh, have teachers apply for these programs, but we're recommending uh, to, to advise these programs. We're recommending a 20% cut, and that would be uh, almost $25,000. So the 20% cut would, would then be, could maybe account for just a few programs disappearing altogether versus like a 20% cut across all the programs. Correct. So, so you're looking for that 20% cost savings by maybe eliminating a handful of the groups that just aren't active. Or they some have or, four members or, in them. And yeah, or well, that's maybe even could to, be combined into another club, you know. Exactly. You know, uh, again, okay. shepherd the students into those yeah. uh, activities that we yeah. do have. 
but that is uh, a 20 percent cut we're recommending at for Brockton High. Thank you. Under athletics, I have met with the athletic director. I am looking at coaches. Uh, we have uh, a number of sports that maybe some sports have one or two coaches. Others might have eight or ten. Obviously, that depends on you know the number of students involved in the sports. But I have asked uh, athletic director uh, Bill Devon to get back to me on some recommendations. Um, you see the next three. Uh, any questions on that? I'll have to get back to you once we've identified any possible cuts there. Are, are some of these positions grant funded or are they just I don't believe they're grant coach. funded grant this would be chapter 70 right. um, middle school sports middle school transportation and middle school supplies and equipment all fall under middle school sports one of the things that we talked about at the middle school level was retaining in grades 4 through 8 our intramural program making it a strong intramural program not necessarily having the competition between West and North, et cetera, but having them work within their own schools and creating opportunities for intramurals. Uh, many more students are able to take part. Uh, and again, this is difficult. I know how important it is for our middle schools. Um, I, I will tell you, uh, very sadly, as we were making this cuts, uh, Mr. Petronio's son was playing or pitching for West and we were back and forth with looking at what the score was. So as we're sitting there making difficult decisions, you know, our own children are taking part in these activities. So, so let me ask you this. If, if you eliminate, let's just say, middle school sports, mm -hmm. are you looking to implement some sort of an after-school intramural program? And if you do so, would the stipends for instruction be the same, or would it be a decrease to what we currently pay because you're still going to need I assume that the most of the money is the instruction right correct so there's a stipend for each coach of each sport but okay. intramurals is an hourly rate of pay and again we would you know we would certainly put a price on the middle schools but we were hoping we would reach you know more students that could take part you wouldn't have them being transported between schools we wouldn't have to purchase that additional equipment. So I, gu I guess what I'd like to see is what is it would be the actual cost savings because it, if it comes out to be about the same amount of money to implement an intramural program due to the cost of the, let's call it coaching or instruction or what have you, I mean the only savings I really see is the savings with respect to transportation. We already have an intramural program. Oh, okay. uh, if you look in, uh, I think it's page 13 in your packet, uh, the middle school, principally six to eight, has a, has a budget already of uh, approximately $84,000 for intramurals. That is uh, separate from the stipend that you're referring to as the coaches. So the intramural program would remain funded the way it is now with the hopes, and I think this is based on feedback from principals in these buildings, that we would expand involvement and perhaps get a little more creative in terms of the variety uh, offering that we, we could have to entice more right. students to participate. The cuts that you see for middle school athletics are specifically for the coaches that are stipend in those three seasons, fall, winter, and spring, along with the transportation for those teams, and then the supplies it would also, I'm assuming, include referees and so forth. So um, we have money in the budget for an intramurals program and hopefully that will be kind of something that is more robust and would you know, increase the in participation in numbers. Do you anticipate this as a straight saving? I, I believe so, yes. And, and trust me, I am the, one of the last people on the planet Earth that wants to, I coached, I, I was at the game today, uh, it's, it's <laughs> integral to the middle schools, but again, if you look at the uh, savings, which is a uh, substantial. I mean, it's almost two hundred fifty thousand dollars when you add those things together. I, I just think, unfortunately, the circumstances that we have now. We're fortunate that we do have money uh, in the budget for intramural. Use. So yes, to me, it's a straight thing. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else on that? Mrs. Joyce. Um, if we look on page 15, under the budget estimate for the athletic program, I do see where the 183 comes out mm -hmm. for the junior high sports, okay, under personnel services. So 
but the overall athletics total budget is $9.89. Where is that in, in the proposed budget on the front page? Where is that incorporated on here? On the front page? Yeah. Is it in a couple of places? I think transportation has the transportation piece. Mm -hmm. And the extracurricular activities, number 16, Five, up at the top of the sheet. 40, oh, okay. I, I, I actually do see where so. the personnel services is. Okay, that's on um, line number 9. And 33. Okay, and 33? Yes. Yes. 33, athletic program. Okay, so where was 443, 440, so the increase is under those two items that we talked about earlier. Okay, under 33. So if you're going to expand the intramural program, are you proposing to increase the line item number 17 from 166, 673? Or do you think you'd be able to do it within that I was budget. trying to do it within that budget. When I say expand, get more students involved in it. Mm-hmm. And we think we can do it with the 166. Well, yes. I mean, if it's basketball, I mean, the, the gym is there. The basketballs are there. If it's soccer, the same thing. The nets are there. The, the balls are there. If it's um, um, baseball, uh, it's really, you already, again. You already have the personnel in place, the coaches in place. That's Mr. Murray. Well, yes, we already you, if you look at it again on page 13, uh -huh. you can see that you have the instructors there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think you have the facility. Hopefully, with an increase in number, you, you may be forced to get a little creative with your schedule in terms of uh, making sure that everybody gets the time that they need in the gym to participate. Right. But, yeah. uh, you know, uh, we've done some other programs, uh, especially in the nice weather, where we've had students both inside and outside of the building mm -hmm. with, a, with a whole variety of things and interestingly enough sometimes people will come and give us a half an hour so I just think in terms of getting uh, students to participate in, in bigger numbers that that is a manageable uh, okay. task right now mm -hmm. uh, you know ideally I'd like to come back to you in you know October and say oh, oh my god we have you know thousands of kids right. participating right. and we need more help but I think realistically right now that's the best way to do okay thank you The next item is assistant athletic directors. You presently uh, have three uh, to correspond to three different seasons. I believe you brought this on a couple of years ago when we had Tom Kenny as the athletic director. There were mandates by the MIAA as far as somebody being present during hockey, during a number of the sporting events. Uh, we're recommending that we eliminate two of those. I believe the winter season was the one that we wanted to have the assistant athletic director. Um, I feel this is again taking a step back. I am talking to the present athletic director uh, who expressed concern about this item. Um, felt that there was a lot of paperwork being done with reporting concussions, the head concussions. Uh, there were a number of mandates where you know, this was a support for such a large athletic program but I am recommending that we cut two of those positions and retain one for the winter season. <coughs> the next one is intramurals at the high school. So when I met with uh, the principal of the high school, one of the things that we were looking at was freshman sports. Um, Sharon Wolder said to me, I'd rather keep the freshman sports, looking at the participation there, and I would rather, if a choice has to be made, I would rather uh, eliminate the intramurals, which is the exact opposite of what we're talking about, you know, for our middle schools. So at the high school, we're recommending to eliminate uh, the intramurals. Um, hopefully the students will be able to take part in all of the sports that are still being offered. We've held that harmless at the high school level, and they still have clubs that they can take part in. It, it depends on the sport. There are some that we have a number of kids show up. Um, they like to go to the weight room. Uh, there are other things that we have that the participation starts out pretty good and then it dwindles off. 
Well, with the freshman sports, we know that's a draw for some kids, getting them connected to the high school and involved in something. Um, there's high participation, and a lot of them are no-cut sports, so we get a lot of kids um, involved in those team sports. Um, do you know which intramurals are pretty active? Which programs are uh, active? The biggest one that we get is probably in the weight room. We get a lot of kids who participate in going to the weight room after school. So would this eliminate that? Um, it would. How would eliminate that? Um, all right, then, then perhaps we need to look at that or just eliminate enough of it that um, it reduces the, um, or gets rid of what's not really being used, utilized, but the ones that are being utilized, perhaps we continue, you know, such as weight room. I know, what's, with, what's happening with the, uh, the lacrosse intramural? How is that in terms of uh, activity? It's been good. Uh, it's been, we've had uh, well, the two full teams um, of boys, both at the high school level and the middle school level. And then we've got kind of a one and a half team in terms of the uh, young ladies. So it's uh, actually been pretty successful. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I think that's one that we got an asterisk. I mean, it just seems like there's a lot of interest and activity in those programs. So we'll see. All right, to be continued on that one. Okay, so the total amount of cuts uh, in programmatic cuts were uh, 2.3 million. Um, going into ordinary maintenance and uh, a number of these items we looked at, uh, Bridgewater State City Labs, that would be a cut of $5,200. What exactly is that? Well, City Lab is an opportunity for students to go to Bridgewater State to take part in City Lab. It's actually a middle school field trip that we would have to cut back on. It's not an elimination, it's a cut program or so it would be an elimination. Discovery Ed, um, that's actually needing an increase of $10,000. And that's what, again, we use for uh, teaching uh, through technology. Um, hub, I'm going to need some help on this one, H, uh, the Hub program. I'm not sure what that contract services was. That's. Hub, I think, is something under Dan Vigent, under technology. So um, I know that, yes, I think the Hub and LCN are both right. um, items that he gets service support from exactly, and he felt that we can cut back on those two budgets that he had. The next one is um, Hawkeye Fence, and that was our uh, rental for the warehouse. That was set up, the set up uh, forklift, those kind of things that we'll just cut out. So what is that, by the way? We were going to, when we were moving to the, to the new yeah, warehouse. Lease, yeah. Now that we're being sent out of the Clockwork building, yeah. we were going to um, try to set it up with a forklift um, to stock high, you know, stock the shelves high, but that cost was the forklift and the shelving we eliminated. Exactly. We were looking for materials and supplies to set up the new warehouse, but we'll uh, make do with what we have. Okay. Again, we brought uh, Dan Vigen in. We also looked at uh, a number of our software items. We were able to recoup $10,000 in miscellaneous software. Again, this is software that we're using, but we're, we're looking to cut back. Next one is HR, Human Resource Ads. We advertise in a number of the local newspapers for uh, positions that are available, while some of that is mandated, we thought we could cut that back another $15,000. IB testing, uh, it doesn't mean that we won't continue with the IB testing. We thought that was gave us a little bit of a cover, gave us additional money under the IB testing. We're able to cut that back $45,000. Fuller Museum is a $5,000 expenditure for passes for students to go to the Fuller Museum, similar to field trips or opportunities for families to go. Uh, that would be a savings of $5,000. Um, the indoor air quality, again, we need to increase this. There are times where we're testing some of the different buildings for mold or allergens. Exactly. We found that going line item by line item through the budget and talking to managers and looking at what we have spent, 
there was some that really need to be increased. So you'll see a couple in here that we did that with. Uh, and telecom was another one of those cuts that. That was a, another one that came, I think, through technology, right. um, a line item that just felt could be reduced. The Mass Insight um, is, again, some of the training we do with our AP teachers. It's a license or a, a registration for a group that sends newsletters, opportunities for professional development. We're recommending a $16,500 cut there. The next one is your program, My Turn. I had an opportunity to speak to your executive director today, Allison Joseph. Uh, they had requested $68,000, and I will remind you that My Turn has been with us for a long time. We support the program. It's for first-generation college students. Many of them have been given opportunities for resume writing, filling out applications for colleges, understanding financial aid. And I'm recommending, again, uh, if we're making teachers in our classroom our priority, I'm recommending a full cut to uh, my turn at $50,000. Uh, school spring is, I'm sorry? A quick question. So what's yeah. the 18000 um, We cut that on the first round. That was a, they asked for an increase. 68. Okay, so we're cutting it completely, completely. the full 68 in the end. Okay. Yes. School spring, uh, $10,000. That's, again, an online application process. Um, we feel that we can handle it in-house as far as the applications that we get from school spring. Many of them don't really, you know, are people that we really interview. You can, in, you can apply on school spring all over, ma many different states. So we felt to apply within our region to send out whether it be some newspaper ads, our own website. There were other opportunities, and we would find a cost savings there of $10,000. Um, fingerprinting, you would put $165,000 in the budget not knowing what this was going to cost. One of the things that we are finding is it costs um, each individual certified staff member uh, $55 to have fingerprinting done. Non-certified staff members, it's going to come at a cost of about $35, I believe. And that will be borne by the individual, such as keeping a license to, you know, to keep your, jo your job. Um, it might have helped with some updates in the Human Resource Office, as we wanted to grow that with technology, with, with upgrades. And at this point here, you know, again, right. I'm recommending that we eliminate that from the budget. A clerk of the works was going to be what you had put in if we were doing the modular classrooms. We will now make sure that we're overseeing any type of facility upgrades, repairs, et cetera, with your two supervisors, your day and evening supervisor uh, in your facilities department. And we will, you know, we're not doing the modules, so we will not need a clerk of the works. Oh, this is going, sorry. Um, while you're going through this, I, you're following along on page 21. Okay, there was one item that's not on this list that I'm wondering about. It's not line item 49, footsteps to brilliance, software license. I didn't think we had made a decision on that in the first place. We had cut that when we did the level. Okay, so that's already been cut. Right. Okay. Yeah. And the next one, Aldo, the contingency. Right, as I, I have a small line item for contingency in the budget, and um, part of my contingency also is what is left over from every uh, individual line item within the budget that I kind of used to balance things off at the end. So in making all these cuts, I was asking to, for a slight increase in that to cover me because I won't have all of these line items we've identified as having small balances to put towards covering shortfalls elsewhere. So I'm just looking to increase that one line item. I mean, I'd, I'd like to have three or 400,000, but I'll settle for 100 at this point. And our last one is uh, Independence Academy. And I want to make very clear um, that all of us know that not just Brockton, certainly many communities are struggling with substance abuse issues. We have made a commitment along with our neighboring communities to support a school like Independence Academy to make sure that those kids are identified, have opportunities to seek treatment, have opportunities to get their high school credential. Uh, we know that certainly leads to their success in many ways. What we're saying at this point is we certainly will support Independence Academy with our per-pupil expenditure and beyond that, probably to the tune of $16,000 or 
or so a student for those students that attend Independence Academy. But the $50,000 that I believe Brockton put towards in the first couple of years uh, is really not something that we can afford at this point. I would like to meet with a number of the surrounding towns that are not facing layoffs and start to work with them to see how, you know, whether we're looking at additional grants or having our grant writers work with them. I know that they have a number of their own in the collaborative. But, you know, just like my turn, I don't think that's a program at this time that we can fund with that amount of money. How many students do we have currently in Independence Academy? I think it fluctuates, but it's been anywhere from four to six this year. I don't know. More, more like two to four. Two to four. And on top of that, we pay our per pupil the cost, overall right? Population, the overall population there is sometimes between 14 and 20. And so their enrollment is down, but not because we don't pay our per pupil individual so, cost. So in addition to the 50, we pay per pupil, correct? Exactly. We, we pay for beyond. each student that goes there, and there was a point in time in which we donated 50 just as kind of startup costs and get the program off the ground. But I think the feeling is that's not something that we can sustain given that right. that means a teacher. Yeah. The, the per pupil costs, how are, how are they incurred? Because I know not all of the Independence Academy students spend the entire school year there. Right. The, the, uh, the cost is set by the legislature. Yep. Um, and it's prorated in terms of if a student leaves, we're rebated. So we're, we're held harmless or rebated right. or, okay. So, so we front so it's the full. It's prorated based on the amount of time that they're there, and, and that's Correct. paid to them in like tuition installments, Correct. similar to what we do with so special ed students or others who, who do out of district services. Okay, thank you. Presently, there's a review going on of Independence Academy of those youngsters out there that we're somehow not reaching, whether they've dropped out, we're not finding them in any of the additional pathways. So, as I said, I will commit to continue working, you know, with Independence Academy, with our neighboring towns and finding ways that we can make sure we are identifying these students. The numbers are very low. And we know that there are certainly higher numbers in our community. So that'll be a pathway, and we will continue to work with them in a collaborative manner, but just not with this type of a commitment at this time. There is no Chapter 70 reimbursement for these students. That's, that's the, the per pupil expenditure. The, because it, on page 27, it says $11,200 per student. So that translates into the 44.8, and then you're recommending that we cut the support portion of 50000 But that 44.8, is I, there any reimbursement? The, the per pupil cost is slightly more than our reimbursement because there's a summer program. Okay, but it. we do recoup some of these funds, that 44.8. Through the reimbursement process. Right, okay. If, if, they are still, if those students are still with us as of October 1. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's not being cut, it's just a support piece. Okay. Right. The it's additional 50,000. Yeah, okay, thank you. So again, with the ordinary maintenance, that was 353,200. Um, and those are the cuts that we are recommending uh, presently. I had, I had a question on uh, utilities. There's a line item here. I've just got to find the page again. Um, for uh, the Corcoran building, for 25000 Has that yes. been cut previously? We did not cut it, but the money we're spending at the Corcoran building, uh, we feel we're going to spend at the new warehouse. That okay. was so you're keeping that, just translate, just transferring it to the new building? Exactly, okay. from the old warehouse to the new warehouse. And we didn't pay any rent for that building? No, we did not. Okay. And I, I also had another question on the technology piece. There was a uh, recommended increase of $800,000 to that line item, Dan. Okay. Uh, the Cuts that you're recommending, how much does that um, cut? In, how much does that impact that increase? So, um, well, on the budget page, it's page 46 for technology in general. So, if we're increasing it by 806,000, and you've got some recommended cuts, is that part of the 800,000, or is that? I don't have. I don't have the. 
Right. But just all you're going to see is the total budget. Line 46. We'll see the total. Well, I, I'll just start from the beginning. Okay. So, originally I proposed a $3 million budget. A what? A $3 million sure. hardware okay. budget. Yeah. Okay. That's aside from software and contract services. Mm -hmm. So $3 million was proposed for hardware. That um, came about because of Rockton's uh, technology initiatives, mm -hmm. digital curriculum. We're heavily invested in digital curriculum now. The park high stakes testing and digital online assessment. Right. A lot of what's going on in the classrooms are integrated with technology. Mm -hmm. So like Superintendent Smith said earlier, this wasn't a wish list budget. A $3 million was very legit. That $3 million was instantly cut down by $2 million. Okay. Within that million dollars, $650,000 is earmarked for an E-rate project okay. that if you cut, we would lose an additional $6 million of federal funding. Right. So now out of a million dollars in technology, I now have about $350,000 to run the entire <laughs> district for an entire year. And I do remember, Dan, that we have cut your budget in years and past. We've had this conversation mm -hmm. a couple of years ago in budget subcommittee that right. we're kicking the can down the road. Right. And in the, in the line on it says a seven year life cycle, mm -hmm. which means now we're going to be in an eight year life cycle, <coughs> which means somewhere down the line in an upcoming year, we will have nine year old computers in yeah. our classrooms. Wow. And that's that's a reality now. And yeah. we talked about this several years ago that yep. this was gonna happen if we didn't do something to intervene. So okay. we're here now. Okay. Unfortunately it coincides with everything else, but that's the reality of technology. We've invested a lot over the years and mm -hmm. you know it's, it's kind of a shame to see that we might be actually stepping backwards. Right. Now. Okay, great. Thank you, Dan. I want to uh, go on in the agenda, and I know we're going to come back to many questions, but, you know, one of the things that we are talking to do about possible funding sources, you've heard me talk about uh, working with our, and I've been, you know, even yesterday marching in the Memorial Day Parade. I found myself the whole way talking to city councilors, answering questions, talking to our legislative reps, you know, it is something that we need to hopefully get together and bring all our elected officials together. I know this is something that you're doing uh, presently with the city council, but this might be time where we get together, we talk to other mayors in gateway cities that are facing similar uh, funding formulas that we are. And we're not going to be able to move the district forward, not this year, not next year, if this is what we continue to have to deal with. Um, and you talk to your legislators, they will be the first to tell you that this is one of the largest funded Chapter 70 budgets that they've had in a while, and they're stymied about why we're in this position. When we had our legislative luncheon, we talked very openly about Title I and the census and not getting the money that we feel that we need in a district as large because of the reporting on the census. We talked about losing race to the top money with not seeing any federal funding or state funding that really had kept us afloat for a number of years, you know, so-called coming down the pike. You know, we've talked about a situation where we have over 500 homeless families where we pick up a transportation budget out of Chapter 70, close to $600,000 that none of your neighboring towns are picking up anything even close to. There is some reimbursement that the city does get for that homeless transportation, but is it something that we necessarily see in our budget? So I bring this up because I, the time is right where we really start to talk about, you know, is it time to look at equity in a lawsuit? That's down the road, but I don't want you to think it's something that I'm going to, you know, forget about after we leave and we so-called settle this budget, which is going to hurt. I think that's something we schedule for the very near future. I've already talked to our communications director, Jocelyn Meek. We're putting together a letter and an invite to try to bring some people to the table to talk about where we go from here. Um, also, uh, one of the things Mr. Minicello and I were talking about I guess if I have to tell, tell you about good news, there are a number of grants. I actually sat up at the high school with their leadership team, with Heather Origi, uh, Laurie Silva, a $750,000 a year grant, you know, that we possibly will, um, you know, cer certainly apply for and maybe, uh, you know, certainly acquire the grant that brings in a PBIS program. And as we start to look at grants, there's two federal grants out there that you're now working on. There's a Carol White physical education grant the money has come in, they've pulled back a little bit. I don't have an exact amount for you when I do, and that's again in the phys ed department. We'll start to talk to you again about how the grants possibly can support either bringing some jobs back or giving us a little bit of breathing room here because we have absolutely none. Um, we'll continue to work with our development office. We were looking to bring in businesses to get support. I think it's 
It's now critical now more than ever. Um, our, our next steps. Just I'm sorry, yep. On, on that item, um, with respect to our local officials, we've been reaching out to our local officials. Many of us, I know, have um, spoken to them because they're obviously in charge of approving the city's purse strings and the budget that the mayor recommends. So um, the more of us that speak to them and inform them, I mean, we've been doing our best in terms of trying to make them aware of the situation that we're in. But the more people that reach out um, to the city side, the better. Um, because, you know, constituents are going to obviously be um, upset about what we're dealing with. But, um, you know, those are shared consist constituents with our city officials as well on the city side. So I would only suggest that we all continue to you know, lobby for our students, for our school system, um, because again, we want to maintain the standard that we um, appreciate and um, continue to try to uphold here in the Brockton Public Schools. So, I would only add to that, Tom, to say, you know, I'm sure I've been hearing from a lot of constituents, parents, students at our high school, um, neighbors, others. Um, I think the they logically reach out to us about the school budget. Um, I, I've been trying to keep track, especially as it relates to emails, to see who else is CC'd on those. Um, sometimes it's the mayor. Seldomly it's our city councilors. Um, and, and for anybody watching on TV or anybody here, as you're writing letters, as you're looking to contact us, you should be looking to contact your city councilor and the mayor as well, because the budget we have is the one that they approve for us. Um, and then we do our best within those confines. And, and so it's important that they hear and understand the same concerns. You know, certainly we can pass them on, but I think it's, it's uh, important for them to hear them from you or, or you know, your, your personal and direct concerns as it relates to these budget cuts and not to, well, I guess, yeah, to apply a little bit of pressure all the way up and down the chain. Um, even our, even our, our state delegation um, you know, they're good people, and they're, but they need to understand the problems. They need to understand who is being impacted and how um, so that they can make decisions as well because we're impacted by their decisions as a school committee. So, um, you know, I've been forwarding on emails that I've been getting to my city councilor and to our councilors at large and others. Um, but they're getting a little annoyed with what we're I'm sure they are, and, and they're faced with the same tough decisions we are. Um, but, you know, when you email me, I can, I can voice those concerns in these meetings, and I can certainly try to prioritize these dollars, but you can see we're facing a lot of tough decisions. Um, ultimately, I'm only working with the amount of money that the city council and, and others appropriate to us. Um, so, so it's important that those concerns go all the way up um, to the city level. I would echo that sentiment. You know, I, I know our state delegation has been very open to you know, me pestering them, if you will, but I feel it's absolutely necessary that, you know, I consistently talk to our state delegation, our, you know, city councils to impress upon them that, you know, we need the funding and um, these are not, you know, pleasant cuts by any stretch of the imagination. Not only that, I lose sight in this city when you think about the Brockton Public Schools. People make decisions about whether to move into places based on their school systems. We've held our head high for a lot of years because of what we offer, AP, IB, sports, middle school sports, things for our kids. So to sit here and when you talk about things that we can do, and I've said very openly, you know, I'm told there's no appetite. You've heard me talk about the tax increase before, but I think you need to take a really hard look at our core values are to support all children. It didn't matter if it was the homeless child coming in, the child that comes from another country, the family that moves from a neighboring town because of the services we provide, whether it be bilingual, whether it be special ed programs. These are things that we've been proud of. And when you look at the average cost, one of the things we pulled, and again, you know, I understand, but when you look at the average tax bill per family, and, and again, I'll say I'm a taxpayer and have been for over 30 years in Brockton. You know, Brockton's, uh, tax bill, the average tax bill is $3,200. Um, there are towns that are a little bit higher, Lynn, Worcester, Lowell. There are some of the urban districts that are a little bit less. 
some of our surrounding towns are much higher. And what, what is that average cost? $100? Is that a cup of coffee a day? I mean, I, I think we have to really look at what our core values are and how we support our children in the Brockton Public Schools. And it's not just the children. It's our families and it's our community. So I think we need to start talking about, again, you know, how we, you know, these are the recommendations I'm making to you. I told you from the very beginning. There are very few recommendations here, and I mean very few, that I'm comfortable with or I feel this will set us back five, ten years. And this is at a time where accountability for some of our schools, you know, we're watching. And, you know, this, this certainly is not the time to be taking these steps back. Since we are talking a little bit about the overall funding, um, for the benefit of uh, some of our newer members, um, if I could um, address this to Mr. Condon, um, with respect to Schedule 19 and understanding Schedule 19, um, the city is, the increase with respect to Chapter 70 fun funding, we increased uh, 8. what million? 8. Point well, 8.5 million on our additional, our enrollment, our growth. Okay. So out of that 8.5, the city is allocating 3.7 to our last year's figure, bringing us up to one, 160 million and change. Correct? Yes. Okay. 163.3. Okay, 163.3. 160.6. Okay. Um, can you break down or just explain to us the chapter, the Schedule 19 costs so that Okay, great. Can I take a few minutes? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's not a simple ex explanation. That's why I wanted to take a few minutes. Uh, Schedule 19 is a result of um, the passage of the Education Reform Act. It's now 20 years old. So when the state adopted the Education Reform Act, it uh, assigned costs in a category of budgets, the so-called foundation budget, and those costs are per student by these different categories. And the student costs vary depending upon the kind of student, what grade level they're in, whether they're a special education student, whether they're from a low-income um, environment, all of those costs add up on a per-student basis to the foundation budget. The foundation budget is then funded from two sources. One is the Chapter 70, and the second is the contribution of local resources, primarily the tax levy by the local community. Uh, chapter 70 is formula-driven. Basically, it's based on your enrollment from a prior years October, you all know that, you've heard that for a long time because it disadvantages Brockton as a growing community. But uh, it's based on your October enrollment. Your local contribution is based now, is, is because the formula has changed about 10 years ago, uh, is based now on a target contribution which is a um, deri derived from the community's relative income level compared for its population compared to the state's relative income level as a whole and the community's property tax base um, compared to the property tax base of the rest of the state. So for Brockton, we're expected to contribute about 20% of our um, per pupil cost out of local resources. The rest comes from Chapter 70. We're a little bit short of that in Brockton on our local contribution, work, but, but we're getting close. So. How much you spend is dependent upon your students and the foundation budget. Where it comes from comes from two sources. And then the next category is where it gets spent because it's spent both in your school budget and in your city budget. The reason for that is that the state recognized that many of these costs that are in the foundation budget itself, all of these costs are represented as part of the foundation categories. Many of these costs are not borne by the school district directly, but instead someplace else, namely in the city budget. Uh, the bis biggest example of that is health insurance cost. Um, so health insurance costs are now at the city uh, level for all of our employees, retired and, um, employees, active employees, school employees, city employees. It's, it's over $50 million. It's a big budget. 
um, but not only health insurance costs are counted on the Schedule 19. There are administrative costs, the presumption there being that um, there is a benefit to the school department. Uh, you may dispute this, but there's supposed to be a benefit to the school department for having guys like me and the treasurer and what used to be the city auditor, Aldo Petronio, on the payroll because we're providing services to the school system that otherwise the school system would have to bear on its own. There are maintenance costs that are borne in the city's budget, which are to the direct benefit of the school department. There's, for example, there's a direct appropriation in the public property uh, budget for $150,000 to serve as a uh, source of revenue for extraordinary maintenance to school system. It can only be spent on school uh, projects and it's basically under the control of Aldo. He, he directs where that money goes to uh, Mr. Thomas. Um, other categories, pension costs for non-teachers. Uh, uh, the, the teachers obviously ca are carried by the state for their pension costs, but there's still a substantial amount of cost in uh, the city's budget, not in your budget, in the city's budget, for retired employees who weren't teachers. That's worth about six or seven million dollars. All of these costs add up now to about 40-something million dollars. Now, uh, I'll come back to the infamous retiree health insurance cost in a minute. but. Uh, Basically, that's, that's, what it, that's what it comes out to. So if you were to take just, for example, I, I had a, um, a telephone conversation today with the folks at Standard & Poor. We're selling a bond anticipation note uh, for the city, which is to finance, finally, the costs that were borne by us for your uh, roof projects and your windows projects at the Raymond and the Davis and the, the East, all of those costs, about $7 million. Anyway, we're selling the bonds on that, and uh, the rating agency is concerned about the city's finances because it sees over a period of time that we have been financing more and more of our operations, whether it's cost assistance provided to the school system or in, on the city side. We're financing those costs by drawing down the city's reserves beyond a point which they think to be prudent. Uh, so to describe why we've been doing that, I took them back to the year 2002 fiscal 2002. And if you look at fiscal 2002, the reason I chose that is um, we experienced a state aid cut in fiscal 2002 as a result of the recession that took place then and the result of the election of uh, Governor Romney in mid-fiscal year. Anyway, in 2002, the city received about $60 million less in Chapter 70 aid than it receives today. You would have thought all $60 million of that came to the benefit of the school system over the years. It didn't. 50 million of it came to you. The reason the 10 million didn't were these Schedule 19 costs went up at such a rate that it, in a sense, grabbed some of that distribution. However, at the same time, the city's unrestricted state aid, the stuff that we get to pay for other costs other than Chapter 70, it didn't go up by 60 million. It went down by 12 million. It went down from 32 million to about 20 million. If you think about the city's relatively poor revenue base, where is a city like Brockton going to make up that 12 million? It wasn't a one-time cut, by the way. It's gone. Every year, 12 million dollars gone from 2002 until today. The value of that, it's not even with an inflation adjustment. You know, at least your Chapter 70 has got some years not much of one, like this year, but an inflation. Nothing, nothing to in, increase for inflation. Just an absolute cut never coming back. At the time, I didn't think that would be the case. At this point, you have to believe it is the case. There's no, uh, no chance, I don't believe, of our seeing that money come back. So $12 million gone. Our tax levy went up at the same time by about $40 million. But the first $12 million went to make up what the state yanked away. So it's really only a little over $30 million. That $30 million has to pay for the increased local contribution that's required to the school system. That's gone from about 20 to 37, 17 million dollars. Now some of it we haven't given directly to you because of those Schedule 19 costs. But the rest of it has gone as an increase to the school system. And in the meantime, we've had all the costs go up as well. We've got costs for our pension costs. We have an obligation, I think, periodically, if not uh, more than we've given to our employees. You've settled contracts with your union employees. I don't object to the people who work for the city making a decent salary, whether they're a school or a city employee. They ought to be well paid. They do good work and hard work, but there isn't enough money to come to good settlements and fair settlements with that amount of money left over. So that's, that's why we've been drawing down reserves. Uh, I don't see an end to it. 
Uh, it gets worse when the political culture is unwilling to pay taxes. Right now, you've got a budget which is constructed on no increase in the property tax lobby, even though you can see, um, if you want to do an objective analysis, that Brockton residents aren't overtaxed. I did it for the city council a year ago. If you want to read it, go to the city's website, look at the city's finance department, look at my famous budget letter for last fiscal year, and you can see the analysis. We pay about 5.5% in Brockton of median income on property taxes. Statewide, 5.5%. We're not overtaxing there. We pay on water and sewer services in Brockton. The average is about $400 for water and a little bit more for sewer. It's $100 or so on the average resident, less than you would be paying in any community which surrounds Brockton, except for maybe one or two. So we don't overtax, we don't overcharge for fees, but our population is not well to do. And because of that, I think they find the imposition of taxes and fees to be a burden to them. So there's our dilemma, and I don't know how we fix it unless you're willing to say either we're going to change our model for delivering services, and I don't see any appetite for that. You're going through that right now. On the city side, we're going to be going through it too, or you're going to have to say we have to swallow hard and make the case for paying, what we, paying the cost of what we consume in terms of services. I think we're assumed under Prop 2.5, Proposition 2.5, that you'll use that annual levy. It's just an inflation index. I think you're assumed that you'll use it, and I think we need to, but right now we're not doing it. I think you need to believe that anything which can be like a utility where the usage can be measured and paid for by a fee which is specific to the usage, we ought to be covering the full cost of those services in those fees. We're not right now. So I, I said I'd come back to the chapter, uh, the Schedule 19 cost. It's a little over $40 million. Every year I estimate each one of these eight categories. Included in these categories, for example, are the cost you pay so that the Chapter 70 dollars that are allocated to Brockton never flows to the city at all because you've got school choice, uh, kids going to West Bridgewater Avon. But the biggest number is for the charter school kids. It's like $4, $4 million leaving the city to go to charter school uh, charter schools where Brockton students are enrolled. A few years ago, that was zero. Four and a half million dollars is a lot of money. That, that's going out. The, the in, insurance costs for health insurance are specifically measured. We look at every single school employee and the health plan they're in, and that's what we charge you for. The maintenance costs are basically, as I said, a specific appropriation or an examination of work, uh, work records of the city employees to see if they actually worked on school buildings. And you know, your school side looks at that with me as well. The only place where I've ever really heard a lot of complaint from the folks who understand Schedule 19 as opposed to those who just think it's a lot of money the city's grabbing, the only place I've really ever heard any complaints are, number one, um, on the maintenance costs, they felt that uh, some of them felt that the uh, city wasn't city workers weren't providing the bang for the buck, and they always waited until it was on overtime, and they did the work on overtime. So to counteract that, the school system a few years ago began hiring people in addition to custodians to do some of that work. So that amount on uh, Schedule 19 has gone down, and the other places on the administrative allocation, which is based on a formula. And basically what we take is a portion of the, the city's uh, law budget, my office's budget, auditing, uh, the mayor's office, city, um, uh, city treasurer collector. And some of those costs get pulled out on my examination saying they don't in any way, shape, or form benefit the school system. But most of the salary costs are allocated and it's based on what percent of the total budget does the uh, school budget represent. And so if it's 45%, 45% of those costs come back. So. You've got two ways of doing that under the law. One, you can do it the way I just described it. Two, you can take a statewide average administrative cost per pupil as charged back across the state. And if we did it that way, we'd charge you another million dollars. So the way we're doing it is, is saving a million bucks. The last one is the retiree health insurance cost. When I prepare the budget recommendation for the mayor, I look at that cost and I say, what is it? I make an assessment as to, uh, to lower it a little bit, and then I count it on preparing the budget for Schedule 19. I do that for one reason, is to simply show it uh, so that it's out there for people to see. I can't count it. When we come to October and we actually create the Schedule 19 as opposed to these estimates, I have to back it out and not count it. And in the last few years, as a result of that, the Schedule 19 costs have been um, 
a little bit overstated because of that, and we end up having a carry forward amount that we owe to the school system every year. It's within what's allowed by the law. If it were 5% of the required spending, we would be penalized on Chapter 70. It isn't. It's usually about 1%. Results in about a million dollars or so that we're short. It has to be made up the next year. And the reason I do it is that when the Education Reform Act was passed, uh, my office uh, and Aldo's predecessor, he, before he was auditor, he actually worked for me as a financial analyst, and before he became financial analyst was another guy that did that job, and he was doing it when the Education Reform Act was passed. He had extensive discussions with the Department of Education as to what of these costs could be counted, I mean, very granular, down to making huge arguments, how come we can't count school crossing guards because we can't? How come we can't, cap can't count capital spending or projects that cost more than 150000 We had long arguments with it. But one thing we argued about was why if we can count pension costs, can't we count health insurance costs for retirees? And they said, because you can't. And no real rationale except to say you can't. So we didn't. Except that 200 districts were allowed because they just, just ignored the, the regulations or the, or the advice, counted those costs. So for forevermore, from 1994 on, their counting costs, which Brockton can't count, if it was a million bucks or so out of the 40 million, it wouldn't make an awful lot of difference, but it's over $8 million. So I put it into the Schedule 19 at the beginning to simply show that were we able to count these, we would be above foundation spending. Most districts can, we can't, and I think it distorts Brockton's performance for us not to be able to count them. I'm not advocating that we ought to really pull those dollars away from your budget. I'm simply saying we ought to get credit for what we're spending that uh, 200 <laughs> districts do get credit for because it looks like Brockton isn't supporting education to the same extent as other, uh, as other communities, and that simply isn't the case. But the problem in the budget this year is not the foundation, uh, in the foundation budget is not the Schedule 19 costs. I don't believe that's the problem. The problem is, number one, the inflation index that was chosen to escalate the, the uh, Chapter 70 was, was bizarre. I don't see any way, shape, or form that you can say that the cost of educating students in Massachusetts went up by less than 1%. Health insurance costs certainly didn't, go, certainly didn't go up by less than 1%. Most districts are giving something to their employees. Even if it's only 2%, they're giving something. 2% the last time I looked is more than 1%. So they're shorting you on health insurance. They're shorting you on personnel cost. Do you think that your gasoline cost, your energy cost are going up by less than 1%? I don't think so. They're shorting you there. I don't know where this statistic came from. I think it's a statistic that looks at what's the cost of paper clips and paper, and I'll agree, maybe those only went up by 1%. But that's what the problem is, because that's worth about $3 million, that short change. The other problem is, and we've talked about this before, the foundation budget for a community like Brockton does not adequately reflect the cost of being, being incurred for your special education population. There's an assumed percentage of students that are in those categories, and Brockton far exceeds that, so you're being shortchanged there. It doesn't adequately reflect the cost that is incurred by a district like Brockton to take care of the low-income students. There's a kicker in the found, uh, foundation budget to give you more money for those kids, but it isn't enough. And if it were enough, don't you think your results in terms of testing would be closer to, say, Newton's than they aren't? Is it because you've got a union workforce? I don't think so. Newton's got a union workforce. The problem is there's not enough money in that foundation formula to take care of the real cost of taking care of those kids. That's where I think the problem is. And then the state aid cut that was made to the city. So where do we have the money to bring more assistance to the table? I do think that we should have, you know, the mayor knows what I think on this. We should have allocated in the budget the 2.5% levy increase. That's worth three million bucks. Some portion of that would have, I don't know what, but some portion of that should have come to the school system and it would have alleviated the problems you're facing. But your budget gap is seven million, six million, something like that that you're trying to find? Yeah, uh, so three million doesn't cover all of that and certainly if we gave you all of it there would be complaints on the other side. I think we're, uh, we're I know folks in Brockton right now think I'm hiding money I'm lying about what's available, and that's, uh, th that's been out there for three or four years. I'll tell you right now, it isn't true. Uh, if it were true, I wouldn't have had the conversation today I had with the S&P uh, ratings folks, because they don't like what they're seeing. We are spending beyond what we should be spending off our reserves and balance sheet to keep things going. But we ought to at least be taking care of where we can take increases in. The water rates are inadequate. The water budget isn't paying, just like you've got Schedule 19, we've got a re reimbursement amount that we count for the 
uh, utility funds that are supposed to pay their own way. If they don't, their costs, that, you know, they've got health insurance costs in the general fund budget too. If they can't reimburse us for that, then that's a shortage of revenue for the city's uh, budget, and there really ought to be a water rate increase to take care of that problem. There's a possibility of about a million and a half dollars of extra revenue if that rate increase just to cover that problem were passed. And I think a lot of that would come the way of helping alleviate these budget problems. Problem is multifaceted, but I don't think it's Schedule 19. Open and honest. And I would say your assessment tonight was very honest and frank. Um, with respect to the um, increase from last year to this year from the Chapter 70, um, the increase is about eight and a half million dollars. The school portion is getting a per, um, around 3.7 and then 4.8 is going to the Schedule 19 increases. Can you just, so that people understand, can you tell us about the 4.8 million that's going yep. to the city side out of that increase? Yep. The biggest increase of all is in health insurance and the second biggest increase of all is in charter school reimbursements. So those two are, I mean, the health insurance, as I've said, I specifically cost that on, on the enrollment, um, I think uh, on March 1st or April 1st by plan, and that's, that's you know, real dollar for dollar. And the charter school is from the state. If you look at the state budget, you'll see that number. That's what's coming off the top of our Chapter 70. On top of that, there is on that infamous administration, uh, last year was budgeted at 3 million, this year it's budgeted at 3.3. That's an increase on budget. But if you look at what we actually uh, incurred on Schedule 9 la 19 last year, it's a little bit less than that. What I do is, I, except for the retiree health insurance, I try to budget these categories conservatively. In other words, I underestimate what the final cost will be. By doing that, it forces the school committee appropriation to be a little bit higher so that we meet the, the minimum spending. The place, the other place that showed a significant increase, uh, Mr. Minicello, is um, uh, the employee benefits line other than insurances, and that's basically a pension assessment. Don't need to sharpen the pencil anymore. Uh, well, I don't know where, if, if last year's actual, not including retiree health insurance, was 38.1 million. This year's actual, not in, this year's budget, not including health insurance, including re in retiree health insurance, is 43.8. But the retiree health insurance estimate is only 5.6. If you pull that back out, it's basically at last year's level, and I know some of those costs are going to go up. So I think we've already done it. Um, if we were to pull more of those costs out, it doesn't mean that they won't be incurred. It just means that they will be estimated low. And I have a hard time then justifying to the other side of the street why it is that we need to pull um, less money in for the public safety function, which is basically where everybody wants to see the money spent right now. Uh, for example, I know one of the categories happens to be those school resource officers uh, that uh, you're looking to cut. It's about $130,000, I think. Well, I only estimated 100, but the city's budget that the mayor submitted to city council assumes that they're going to be paid to the extent that they've been paid in the past by the, um, by the school committee. So, you know, if you don't pay them that way, then you've just given the bill for those officers to the school, from the school side to the city side, and, you know, he's going to have to scramble around to find that, that $130,000. So it, it's, you know, it's like squeezing a balloon. If you squeeze it in one place, it pops out someplace else. Well, in light of what we're facing, I'm not going to be bashful to at least ask. Don't blame you, uh, but you know what I think really ought to be done is not so much on Schedule 19, but on the revenue side. That's where I, that's where I think there's leverage. You, know, you might find 100,000 or 200,000 dollars in disagreement between the city and the school on, on Schedule 19, but a tax levy, which all you need to do is recommend its appropriation and get the city council to vote it, because it's you know we're just talking about what's allowed under the law, and a water rate increase for a utility fund which isn't balancing its budgets right now. Those those two things seem to me to be basic starting points that good budgeting would have in the budget. Any questions, uh, Mr. Henningsen? So one of the things that I've read the mayor is trying to do is go after nonprofits and ask them for a payment in lieu of taxes. Um, do we have a, a rough estimate of what that would look like? And if we got what you know he, he's looking to see, what would, would we see any of that? 
Well, uh, if the uh, mayor were successful in getting agreement to pay that because he can't compel it, it would have to be voluntary, uh, then that would be uh, the, the kind of general fund revenues that are available for appropriation to any purpose, you know, whether it's school transportation, for whether it's an increase in your uh, net school spending appropriation, um, or for buying a, buying a cop, or as I'd like to sue to see Let's start to rebuild the city's reserves. They've dwindled to a level where I'm, I'm not comfortable that we're able to withstand uh, future cost. Um, I don't have a lot of hope that in this budget year he'll have any any success on that. I think there, are, you know, again to be frank here, there are a couple of institutions I think which probably are capable of paying. One would be the Brockton Hospital, and the uh, the other would be the the YMCA. Um, the but you know these institutions develop their budgets just as we do. So you can't be coming at them in the middle of a fiscal year saying, come to the table with more money and expect that they will at that time. Uh, the second is that uh, on that, the timing isn't too good. The second is that um, there's nothing to compel it. I actually think that there ought to be, if, um, if revenues for public finance in Massachusetts are so constrained, especially in cities like Brockton where the uh, tax base isn't that great, that you need to be banging out there for every nickel you can get. I think that it's really something that the state should do to put, so it's not a variation from one community to the next, what these hospitals pay or, or nonprofit institutions pay. There ought to be some mechanism that says, here's how we're going to assess some level of uh, taxation. It isn't voluntary. It's it's, it's something you're able to impose under law. So it's fair from Brockton to Plymouth, you know. I mean, the hospital in Plymouth should be paying more than the hospital in Brockton and vice versa. And, 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 you know, Mass General, if it's making millions of dollars of contribution to Boston, it's a different kind of hospital because of its research status than Brockton. But still, some level of contribution ought to be possible across the state on those. And, but, so I think it's, a, it's, it's on the state, I think, to fix that. I don't, I don't see much likelihood of it. But if you got money, it's, it's available. But it's hundreds, not of thousands, not millions. And our problem is millions. Yeah. But millions any, and millions and millions. Any bit helps if we That's can true. Get, you know, That's an true. That's true. He the his process. proposal wasn't um, uh, wasn't received with open arms. It was Yeah. Not. And and just a quick other question. Um, I remember and and you can, you know, explain this a little bit better, but I remember watching a city council meeting uh, maybe a year or so back and they were discussing the health insurance and how they were going to switch mm -hmm. health insurance plans and it was going to save and there was two options on the table and the city council decided to take one option versus another. Right. And that actually wasn't as big a savings as Correct. Us. And so if, if is that doing anything to control the costs or? Oh, no, know? it did. It did. Uh, what, uh, what the city council rejected was the uh, reform legislation that was proposed by uh, Governor Patrick and approved by the legislature, but it was a local option uh, statute. And so if the city of Brockton had adopted it, uh, it would have saved, I think, a little over $5 million. However, the savings would have been achieved simply by imposing it on the retirees and workers according to these GIC-like plans. Uh, a lot of the collective bargaining uh, unions in the city didn't like the idea that the collective bargaining process was circumvented by that, and they complained to the city council. City council said, okay, we hear you on that. We aren't going to accept this. We're going to force it to happen at the bargaining table. So we did go to the bargaining table, and we saved uh, a substantial amount of money with what we achieved at the bargaining table. And it was, um, it, was a, it was a good process. It was consortium bargaining. All the unions came together. Uh, but the savings weren't as great. It was probably two million dollars worth of savings that would have been available had they accepted the reform legislation that we didn't get because they went the collective bargaining route. Uh, the bad side is that the money wasn't as great. The good side is that it wasn't imposed. I mean, it recognized that uh, city employees have collective bargaining rights and they ought not to have been circumvented, but you lost a couple million dollars by it. Okay, thanks. Good luck. <laughs> I, I do sympathize with you. Uh, I, I agree with what the superintendent said. This isn't a budget that um, the city should be proud of. The schools, um, schools are an essential part. Good schools in Brockton are an essential part of the Brockton image. Um, Brockton's always been a kind of working class community but a working class community which really, really supported its school system. And it does have a big difference in how you attract people and businesses long term to a community. If you don't have a good school system, they don't come. They just don't. So.
good luck in making it happen. So, thanks. Um, as I said, next steps I will come back to talking about some of the special ed. And as I said, it's, it's not really savings. It's, it's looking at some of the money that we're spending in contracted services uh, and hopefully bringing back. I, I could be making some recommendations about actually hiring some additional uh, SPED staff to be a cost savings. Um, the letters, as I said, to uh, other non-certified staff will be going out this Friday. Uh, I have had an opportunity to meet or speak with uh, the union representatives. I have made a commitment to parents in the community and to all of our employees that I will continue to keep them updated. We had information on the website recently as far as the PowerPoint that was given to you on the level services budget, some of the restrictions that are causing some of the problems. When I met with the superintendent's PAC last Monday, we had uh, well over 50 people there, uh, myself and the deputy superintendents. Uh, met with uh, parents. They want to be updated. Many of them were there with their PowerPoint, and I want to be able to continue to give them information as we go through this process. And tonight we need to obviously set some additional subcommittee meetings and be prepared for presently June 9th is the meeting we have scheduled for the City Council budget hearing. But obviously before we do that tonight, we want to talk about some of the cuts that we've presented because along with the cuts that we've made, including the reduction in force notices, the programmatic cuts, the ordinary maintenance, we came uh, up to $11.5 million. Well, obviously, we're trying to make up a $6 million budget shortfall. So at this point, we can start to talk about bringing back uh, some of, and again, the, the teachers are a priority. I will continue to work with all other uh, employees, unions to, you know, to see what we can do about continuing to, to bring uh, jobs back. But that's my recommendation this evening. I'm just looking at the calendar, and um, I think we're going to need another meeting Monday the 2nd. Um, now, that is a night that we have a negotiation scheduled, but I think we're going to have to bump that negotiation. Um, so, can everyone take a look at their calendars for Monday, June 2nd? Everyone free? Yes? Okay. okay um, uh, yeah, I definitely think we have to... I can, we'll get you the information you requested so you have it, obviously, ahead of time some of the information that you requested tonight. We'll get that to you. Okay. 6 p.m.? Um, 6.30? 6.30, is that better? 6.30? That's Monday the 2nd. That'll be our next meeting. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll get additional information to you ahead of time. Okay. Okay. Um, Also, just to let you know, Mr. Petronio has prepared uh, the budget books for the City Council. They were meeting tonight. We put together a letter letting them have uh, the front part of the budget with all the information behind it is the superintendent's recommended budget, but also you know, a letter letting them know that it's not the school committee recommended budget, that we would replace the superintendent's recommended budget once you approve a budget going forward. But we wanted to make sure there was a concern a couple of years ago as to the timely manner that they had the information to look through. So we'll have this information to them within the next day or two. Correct. Okay. Um, all right. Um, next steps? Oh, the uh, incentives. Okay. One of the things that uh, we had, um, one of the things that we had talked about again were ways, ways that we can get assistance. And many times when we're faced with these kinds of budget cuts, you know, we put together a plan by going out to people that are close to retirement. Uh, again, possibly providing some kind of an incentive. It frees up a spot. It helps with our unemployment. 
and it ends up actually being a cost savings. Uh, Dr. Moran is looking at every one of the, through attrition, people retiring, leaving, she's now reviewing that. I believe there, is Dr. Moran here? No. Okay. So I, the next meeting, so we have to I believe there were some dates that people also had to report back as to whether they were coming back into the district. Dr. Moran, are you hiding back there? I didn't see you at all tonight. <laughs> um, like Superintendent Smith said, we, um, we're looking at all of the retirements and some positions that we may not fill immediately um, in order to, um, you know, obviously have places to um, hopefully bring people back before the end of the school year. So at the next meeting, we can <coughs> overall equation, correct? Yes. Yeah. What I've given you here is a sheet preparing um, a possible incentive, not for someone that's retiring um, in the next budget yeah. year, but beyond that. So someone more than a year from now. The, this is an amount that I kind of prepared that I thought would be um, still a savings to us, but yet an incentive enough that maybe someone would leave a year early. It works best if someone's already at 80%. And they're just working because they like coming to work. Um, this is again um, s something that, um, if it entices them, then we have a retirement as opposed to a layoff. But it's open for discussion with the school committee. We had done this, I think, two years ago or three years ago. This looks like a little different formula, though. It's, um, this or formula just, is... Or just because the numbers changed? Is that it's it, that, but it's also it's a little, a little stronger in the amount because we didn't have anyone. Um, we may, I think we only had two people out of the whole district that took it last time around. So uh, seeing that we're in a little more dire straits this time, I felt that it was better to give someone a retirement party than it was to give them a pink slip so that we'd be willing to pass off more of the savings to go that route. So again, it's something that, um, you know, would be individual by individual. If, um, if they were to leave halfway through the year, we could maybe look at adjusting that number to half of it, if that's what our savings would be. Is this something that you want? Um, direction on this evening? Or? Yes. So we can approach people. So you listed all these as averages. So mm -hmm. these costs would fluctuate based on the actual or, or so you No, I think, I think the dollar amount we'd have to give, um, we'd have to, flat. Flat. would be flat. Okay, so it wouldn't fluctuate so. based on who was retiring and what their salary was. It would be flat based on the average. Right. The right. I'm assuming the person retiring is at a very high salary because they're in the end of their career. Yeah. And what I'm basing the savings is that person at the bottom of the ladder who would have been laid off. Been laid off. Okay. So. So that we actually have a, net, a certain amount of net gain. Yes. So for our certified staff members, uh, the <coughs> incentive would be twenty-six thousand. Our custodian would be twenty-two thousand. Administrative assistance twenty thousand, and our paras at fourteen thousand. Based on what we just said, the net savings would actually fluctuate, right? Exactly. The net savings would, would, would fluctuate. So these are an average net savings. And, and, if, and if it is, you know, assumably those higher salary folks who are retiring, that savings gap actually increases. It, it could, depending on how you do the backfilling. Okay. Or if we do. Or if you do. Exactly. So that net savings, the layoff, <coughs> after you factor in the incentive? Yes. Oh, okay. which column are you talking about? The net savings from layoff? <coughs> if you take the BEA, it's 34000 Right. That's what we would save by laying off a BEA. 
If we lay off, uh, you know, for a second year BEA employee, we save about thirty-four thousand overall in the budget. Okay, so um, so what we're projecting is offering someone on the other end of the spectrum twenty-six thousand to leave one year early. Right. So where is our savings? Our savings is in the middle. It would be the eight thousand dollars difference between the two. But again, really, I think our savings is the fact that you have someone retiring as opposed to being laid off. I get that, yeah. So you take that unemployment cost out. Exactly. <clears throat> but you're saving the salary. How are you saving on the health insurance? Because they're no longer... Um, when they retire, they still maintain their health insurance through the city, correct? Some do. The retiree. That's part of our so, chapter 19. Uh, schedule 19. Schedule 19. Um, so how is that a savings? Well, I was looking at the savings from the person who actually gets laid off. The, the fact that we're, um, I see what you're saying. The fact that, the, I was looking at the fact that you're not laying off that person, you're no longer um, saving the health insurance. If you lay them off, then you, then you charge them. They, they are eligible for COBRA. Right. But you don't incur that cost, the health, ins health insurance costs. But you do, right. you have to assume that you do for the retiree. You can't assume that you're, that you're not. Right. Okay. So after, take, if you get one, in, one BEA member mm -hmm. to take this incentive of 26000 based on this average salary, what is the true savings on that incentivized employee? Well, the retiree health insurance cost, we don't pay. We don't claim. We we don't have that cost when they retire. We only have it while they're an active employee. So by them retiring, mm -hmm. the cost is paid, but it doesn't affect our budget. It doesn't, isn't that part of our Schedule 19? It, it's in there for the budget, but it's not in there for the actual. It's a chargeback. We don't actually pay it in the end. Okay. But these, again, okay, these take amounts. Okay, the, take, the, take the health insurance savings off then. Okay, mm -hmm. say, say we are saving it, okay? So what is the true savings? That's after the incentive. I, I need to get a handle on exactly how much we're going to save on that one person. I think the true savings how is it gonna help on that our budget? is $8,000. Is $8, okay. So it's going to be the difference between the net savings and the maximum retirement. The salary savings is 22, and the incentive is 26. Oh, you're taking the net savings, right. 34, the 34 to the, and the 26. 26. Okay. How many people would be eligible for this? Do you know? We don't know yet. And I mean, you can look at anyone that's been here that's at um, maximum pension amount, 80%, and you can kind of assume mm -hmm. from there. But there are also people that could be at 76% that are just ready to go and are willing to do it. So it's hard to say. We've got people beyond 80% that don't want to retire. So that's why we kind of made this a little more rich, hoping to pick them up. Right. What did we offer last time? Do you remember? I think we're at twenty thousand for BEA. Okay. And fifteen for. Fifteen for custodians. 15 for custodians. <coughs> was it based off of a percentage then? It it was based off a of percentage then, um, and we did it a little more. Um, we, we kept it a little more in line with what the state had been offering in other communities at the time. So that's the figures we're working off of.
Well, like I said, we didn't receive that many people that took this option last time. So we really wanted to make the incentive something that it was something that was more palatable that they would actually go for. So um, that's why I come up with a slightly higher amount. So. So the savings is nominal, but what it does is it basically someone that's going to lose their job, they remain, and someone that would like to leave, leaves. And exactly. The system's held harmless, and we save a few dollars in the making. And I try. I mean, so. And I try and cover these costs in this year's budget because they retire by June thirtieth. So I pay to this year, which frees up more money in next year. So there's no downside to doing this. Correct. Financially, we're not shooting ourselves in the foot. Correct. Okay. I mean, it's, a, it's not substantial savings, but it's a few yeah. bucks. But it, but someone that might lose their job might have a job, which yeah. is significant. Yeah, and we continue to maintain that savings because you're bringing back somebody that that is not at the top of their salary schedule. So n next year we maintain that person that hasn't been here for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And that newer person um, usually doesn't draw down on the health insurance as much as mm -hmm. the retired person. Yeah. So there's other spots where we kind of mm -hmm. recoup potential savings moving forward. Yeah. That, that we can't quite equate it yet, but, but Correct. We'll, we'll likely see. Plus we keep a young good teacher in the district. Yeah. Okay, so um, would you like a motion on this? Yes. Yes. Motion to approve retirement incentive program. Second, any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, so we'll see how many people this appeals to. Yes, the, the way the program worked last time was that the school committee had final approval. So if 300 people wanted this, <laughs> you could say, well, wait a minute. You know, we're, we, we hold final approval on how many are actually going to get it. That's how the, that's how the, uh, that's how the letter went out last time. Yeah. Is there, is there a deadline or a cap on, I mean, the cap would be set by us, but is there a deadline where they have to declare intention by? Yes. Um, the end of this work year. It'll be the end of work year, yes, and we'll get it out as soon as we possibly can, so. Okay. So what I would, if you're sending out a letter, I would have that language in it, but first come, first serve would be the priority. So, you know what I mean? Sure. In terms of how you decide, I think well, whoever's, time stamp whoever, them yeah, time, whoever's letters come in first. So if we do have. I mean, if we have that problem, I'm not okay. sure we're going to. But if Dr. Marin and I have started to look at the list, I would like to tell you we're in a large retirement years, but those years seem to be gone. So we do have a list of people scheduled to retire, you know, within the next year or so and we'll take a look at it. Not everybody will reach 80%. It could be some, as you said, you know, 78%, 77, 76, that this might be an incentive for them. But I can't say it's a large list. But we want to be able to put that out there. As I said, I want to meet with the unions. I want to hear what suggestions they might have uh, to assist us in knowing that we have been uh, very transparent in what we're dealing with. So hopefully when I meet with them, we'll talk about this incentive and also talk about some of the suggestions that they might have. Can we schedule that meeting with the unions prior to next Monday's meeting? I'm going to attempt to do that first thing tomorrow. Okay, and great. as I said, I did have dialogue with them today. Um, they were very upset, uh, very concerned about their members, as they should be. Uh, and I'll say the same thing to them that I have said to the teachers. We will continue to support you and look for ways to uh, make sure we have the workforce that we need and let me say again, for over 17,000 students and growing. This is not a community facing a declining enrollment, as many of the other communities are around us. You know, we gave you the chart. We have the largest growth, I believe, in the state for students. Mm -hmm. We do. Um, I, I think that, yes, they're very upset, but I don't think that uh, the school committee nor this administration um, doesn't feel what's going on as well. I mean, we're all... We're all feeling this. No one is uh, happy about what's going on. And I would suggest, as you heard Mr. Condon, basically spell out from the city's perspective and um, from his perspective as a very um, professional and learned CFO, um, revenue seems to be the issue. And the more public officials you speak to, and we all speak to, everyone in this room, um, the better off we're going to be with respect to preserving what we so value here in the Brockton Public Schools. So. 
And, and I agree, you know, people are asking, you know, how they can advocate, and, and I'll say this to everybody. You know, I believe we do need to advocate for these children and these families. You know, we do need to be that voice that starts to talk about, you know, what's right, what are our core values, um, how do we continue to have we talk about, again, our children being competitive, being able to make sure they have, and our kids have done exceptionally well. You take a look at this class graduating. They have had, again, an excellent education in the Brockton Public Schools, able to get accepted at some of your finest colleges around. And we want to be able to continue to give them those opportunities. And not every community has that. So I, I hope when you look at what we did tonight, it doesn't feel good. But I hope you understand how much we protected the instructional core. And uh, do we want to wait until Monday night as far as looking at the reductions and bringing back staff. We'll talk about that at the Monday night meeting after you've had a chance to look at things. We'll get you the additional information. Yeah, I mean, I definitely want to see what was happening through attrition. I mean, you know, that, that could be one, Kathy, maybe, um, Dr. Moran, maybe 20 positions, 25 positions. No, Aldo's shaking his head. <laughs> Tell me the good news, Aldo. Very lucky. It's about may, maybe eight or ten. Wonderful. Is this a small group going out this year, or is it? I mean, yes. Yeah. We've had some that have already gone out during the course of this year, but those that are still scheduled to go. Okay. So I will report back to you. I'll set up the meeting as quickly as possible with the unions. Okay. Great. Um, and you're going to be reviewing um, with uh, Mrs. Mason on SPED. She's done a good job so far with respect to trying to trim costs and. Um, we'll, well, we can actually call on her again to try and do that. I, I will repeat for you once again, and, and I know Mrs. Joyce, you weren't here, and I wanted you to hear, you know, that when I started out, I talked about the superintendent recommended budget of $173 million. It is not a fluff budget. It was a budget that sat with, and when we had our retreat in February, you remember me saying that starting July 1st of this year, I would bring every principal forward, department heads, directors, and we would start to build our budget. Well, in some of those cases, we started to do that this year. You know, special education bilingual departments were, were two of those departments. And again, those were not positions that were positions, that they, they were mandated by either IEPs, by classrooms that we need to have here in the Brockton Public Schools, you know, by our growing population. So again, I want to make that clear when you look at the superintendent's recommended budget. You know, we're not moving forward by never mind the level services budget, but now making even additional cuts again, six million shortfall uh, to what we're requesting. And I do want to say to everybody that I have great concern that this will set us back. I certainly am willing to to work with everyone to find uh, any kinds of savings that we can find. But when I tell you that we've gone through this with a fine tooth comb, we have looked at every single item and we'll continue to do that. And the priority will be for our teachers in the classroom and our support staff to continue to do the good work that they've done. And just to repeat, uh, Ju Monday, June 9th, uh, City Council Chamber is when they'll be um, having their budget meeting. So you, people would want to voice and attend that meeting <coughs> to make sure that uh, uh, the message is clear in terms of what people's priorities are. So um, what time is that, Aldo? 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock, I think, when the it uh, might even be 6.30 when the mayor opens up the meeting. He'll make his speech right. and then move into the budgets. We're, I think, number four and number five on the list. Okay, we'll get a time on that so that the next meeting we'll make sure we have the right time. Okay, anyone else? Would you like a motion to adjourn? Yes, a motion to adjourn. <laughs> okay. Second? Someone? Okay, all in favor? Thank you.